This Livingston City Commission meeting is called to order. Roll call, please. Chair Means. Here. Vice Chair Kale. Here. Commissioner Friedman. Here. Here. Commissioner Schwartz. Present. And Commissioner Lyons. Here. Yes. Of course. Yes. Next up on the agenda is general public comment. Individuals are reminded that public comments should be limited to items over which the City Commission has supervision controls jurisdiction or as advisory power so folks that want to give general public comment we'll start with people in the room if you come up and start with your name and address please welcome leslie well i left them on the uh, good old printer so oh, no. um i don't know how quick you can pull up uh, uh your uh, parking ordinances but um i brought up this up before uh this was last year and I've been approached by more meetings, uh, with more meetings with uh, local businesses and a little bit more specific to um, our beauty salons. And if any of you've been in a beauty salon or your wife, gentlemen, uh, it takes a good two and a half to three hours to get your hair uh, colored and no longer gray. And our parking is two hours and uh, running out the door to go do that with big rollers on your head, trying to find another parking spot, et cetera is uh, it's a huge you know, issue. And we have five places in our downtown area within our district. Um, so my proposal again, um, so it's section 9-248. And that would be, uh, you have an A and a B. And um, the only ordinances that you currently have are for, it says uh, for building and construction. So it's an extended time limit that you can get from the building department. And um, what I'm proposing, and um, I again could ask, uh, write it up a little bit better and put it on the next agenda, would be to look at an extended parking permit. So this would be an annual permit. This would be letter C underneath this section that could be purchased by the business owners, the specific business owners. Um, so that would be income to the city, right? To extend it to a three hour period. And it would be something like extended three hour parking permits for specific businesses can be purchased on an annual basis from the building department. Um, and I do know that there has to be a resolution by the city commission to be able to approve not only the parking for construction permits that you had to approve to put that into ordinances. So then you would have to pass an ordinance for uh, an extended parking permit. Um, you know, I was approached by one particular business that was more about loading and unloading, sometimes doing estate sales. It's really difficult to get all the product in there um, within that two hour period. But I think that if we, if you take a look and start with your beauty salons, there are other communities that actually have these permits that you can actually purchase. So if you have a business um, that has say three, four chairs in there and they purchase two annual permits, they can hand it to the person, they can run out, put it on their little mm -hmm. thing so they don't get you know flagged for a ticket, come back in and three hours, they walk back in, hand it to the business owner. And if you wanna charge them, say a business lost it, they can come in and get another one. So this is my proposal tonight, you know, try to find a happy medium to some of our uh, businesses that are, you know, keeping our downtown nice and full and busy and, you know, uh, give them a chance to not have to worry about, you know, tickets and all the whatnot. So um, that is it. And I know that under parking, there was another part which is sitting on a copy of back at the office. So I don't know if I need to, I guess, address it with you, write something up, bring it on as an actual item for oh, the agenda. I can respond to it. Uh, Leslie, can you repeat the code again, please? Uh, yeah, section 9-248, which would be under parking uh, permits. Mm -hmm. There's only one section for parking. Permits. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I would offer... Um, and I, I'm happy to hear from other commissioners, even though we don't normally do this at this point in the meeting, I would offer that we're doing a master downtown plan right now, a downtown master yeah. plan. And part of that is parking. And I believe the commission is looking for really robust public <coughs> engagement around all issues related to downtown, including parking. So I would be very thrilled if you and other business owners contributed to that process so that we can make sure that it was we're really looking for a robust plan to address a lot of things at once rather than um, fixes that might have to be changed through a plan later. 
Do yeah. other commissioners feel that they would no, rather I, have I, it go through? Yeah, I agree with that 100%. Yeah. That's good. Other that way we get you know more people involved and you know more voices you know heard. So, oh yeah, they all throughout told me downtown. They just come and show up. So when I did discuss, well, I just, with, I'm sorry, Leslie. Other commissioners, do you are you comfortable with it going through the downtown plan as opposed mm -hmm. to like an ordinance? Yeah. Immediately, I see a nod from Commissioner yeah. Lyons. <laughs> That's not good to you, Mal. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, if we didn't have it going on, I would say yeah, I'd look towards an ordinance. Right. But since we're looking at specifically parking in this plan yeah that's so time I, to address it now so i don't think you need to bring anything to print however mr danger can you let leslie know where the best place to engage would be because i believe you're the city person in charge of this absolutely yes do you want to let her know we have a city staff person actually here but um i don't know if you get my newsletter if you subscribe but there was a link to the um survey and the web the project website that will have information on how to engage but i can also say that the consultant will be in town august 15 through 17 and i'll have jen our city planning have to reach out to you for yeah having the Thank you. Every commerce part of the plan would be great. So thank you. Yeah, Leslie, absolutely. thank you for the very timely comment that you nailed it with your timing for the downtown oh. comment. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Are there other folks here that want to give general public comment? Hi, Patricia. Oh, no sign in sheet. Oh, there's no sign in tonight. We can get to the slide that. Don't know where I live. <laughs> Do you have, um, um, thank you. Um, I mean, just uh, two short things. I'm I rescinded the letter I sent earlier today. Um, I had two different emails following the letter. One was at 450, the other was 458. The 450 I sent the correct attachment three. At 458, I just simply rescinded the whole letter. Um, my son has always said someone born and raised in Montana should not be allowed within 100 feet of any computer anywhere. <laughs> so I, I really did put the wrong uh, attachment three in the letter. So I just wanted to inform you of that. Thank, Thank you, you. Patricia. Thank you, Patricia. <laughs> Well, the other thing was, uh, I wanted to thank you very much. I had sent uh, information regarding the uh, Park Street's painting at the Civic Center, which I value enormously. He spent almost a month. It's an original painting. Very few towns have a, an original painting by a well-known artist. It is that large. And uh, we have parked material in front of it. We have, um, so, and I did send you a material about the possibility of um, painting the Civic Center and fixing it so that that painting is shown the way it should be shown. So thank you very much for. Uh, removing all that material in front of this beautiful painting that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Patricia. Public art is really important to a community like ours. Thank you, Patricia. And Mr. is that property also in the area that the downtown master plan is it, yes, is? it is. So I would also it offer. It is in the urban renewal. Yeah, Patricia, I just. I just want to offer that the downtown master plan conversation is another appropriate place to take your comments really? about this. Yeah, oh, we love to do that. Yeah, we did so this, but not we can't have a total conversation right now. The way yeah. That. However, I would suggest if you're open to it, submitting all that information. Okay. Um, to, there's, to there's that. a. You get Mr. Gager's newsletters, I assume. I do. So there should be in his last newsletter information on how to engage with that process. So please just make sure that the consultants get all that information and it'll be great. So we can have a whole community conversation around it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Because one other thing I wanted to say is we, for example, on painting, we've got an estimate of $87,000, but, uh, and then we got a, a same painting, the painting, the civic center and the exterior of the band shell of $43,000. So obviously the second estimate is pretty rare that you would find something 
And I, I know that the community would engage, community would engage in this as well because we love that center. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Are there other folks here that would like to give general public comment? Thanks. Yeah, please do sign in. Thanks, Leslie. I forgot one thing. Is it okay? Can you do it in 30 seconds or less? Yeah. <laughs> um, we just sent the, uh, the big exhibit back. We had 682 people come to view it. Congratulations. And we raised over $400, so it only cost us a little bit to send it out. Congratulations. I, I know. That's super successful. That's awesome. And thank you for the update. Rick, are you going to join us? I am going to join. Uh, Rick Van Aken, 220 West Montana, on North Side. Um, I don't think I have anything particularly uh, just necessarily a uh, um, downtown master plan or anything <laughs> like that. Um, but I, I'm specifically here to uh, suggest to the uh, to the city um, and the commission that uh, we're going to have to find a way. I guess my first inclination is to say to lean on the railroad to uh, number one do something about that Fifth Street crossing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know about everybody else, but I don't think my car can take it much more. Yeah. Um, I look at like a, a, one of the things that we have to think about is that, um, you know, everybody worries about or thinks about how much, you know, uh, it might cost us in taxes to do a, um, something, but how much is it costing us some wear and tear on our cars? Um, I believe that the reason why that crossing is so bad right now is because when the when the railroad uh, uh, added in a second main line uh, here a year or two ago or whatever, anyway, they 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 dug the the they trenched down the the rail bed uh, such that the the rails are like four inches below the level of the of the pavement i don't know if the pavement needs to be lowered or what but uh, but the railroad does have the uh, the um those uh, rubber uh crossing pads mm -hmm. that i think they can get them as as deep as they need them so, so i don't know what the hang up is but anyway um we need to get something done um in lieu of uh getting something like that um, I, uh, um, I think that we really need to think about working on a, um, on a, uh, um, good neighbor policy relationship with that railroad. Mm -hmm. Um, my understanding is now that Burlington Northern won't actually take over the rail line operating it, um, until after the first of the year sometime. Um, but in the meantime, um, it wouldn't be that hard for, for um, uh, maintenance away to come in and, and, uh, and take care of that crossing. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, um, I was going to ask. That was I was going to yeah, yeah. do that. Yeah. 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 Uh, Mr. Gager, did you have anything you wanted to offer? Yes, I would offer to the commission that um, <clears throat> I'd say within the last uh, three weeks or so, I've spoken to the railroad about the, the condition of the Fifth Street crossing, and it's my understanding that we should expect some improvements in the month of August to the crossing, um, possibly even up to and including uh, concrete precast panels to replace the, the rubber that's out there these days. So uh, I am optimistic that, that by Labor Day, we should have an improved Fifth Street crossing. Well, I hope we can last that long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is there anyone else that would like to give general public comment in the room today? I'm going to look to the folks online. Is there anyone online that wants to give general public comment? 
I don't see any. I just want to say um, thanks, public. I feel like we're really in sync, the public comment and the city right now. It was like well-timed comments and actions from the city. So thank you for bringing it to us. And we hope for your engagement with the downtown plan also. All right, next on the agenda are consent items A through C. Are there any that the commissioners would like to hold for discussion? Or can I have a motion on consent items A through C? I'll make a motion to approve consent items A through C. Second. Motion by Kale and a second by Friedman. I just want to offer one super quick amendment to the minutes that I think I forgot the other day. Uh, before we vote, yeah. um, on page seven, it talks about staff in attendance. Yeah. I think that we actually had Director Holmes and Director Tar here, and mm -hmm. I'm not sure if there were other staff that wouldn't have been visible on screen, but I think I remember those two directors. Mm -hmm. They were indeed here in the audience, yes. Okay, so we will. thank you. I just wanna make sure they're included. Thank you. Okay, that's the only amendment I have. Um, so do we need to make a motion to amend that or can we just amend the minutes without an amendment to the motion? Uh, you know, it would be probably cleanest if, if somebody wanted to offer an amended motion. Okay. I can offer the amended motion since I was stuck late. So I want to make a motion to amend to reflect the changes to the minutes to include Director Holmes and Director Tar. So a second for the amendment. Second. So motion to amend by new, second by Kale. So all in favor of the amendment, say aye. 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 <clears throat> yes. Thank you. So 5-0 on the amendment. And then all in favor of the original motion to accept A through C, all in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, 5-0, motion passes. Thank you all. all. Right, next on the agenda is scheduled public comment. The TBID update and annual report, Mr. Gager. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, we have a report from Chris King of the TBID on the activities for the last year. So I will turn it over to Chris. Thank you. Since there was a small turnaround time, um, I hope that the commission has had a chance to go through um, the reports from the TBID, the CBB, and the DMO. Um, I know it's 52 pages long, but we're a complicated group. Um, and I started off um, with a flow chart because it's really confusing to a lot of people how that works. Um, LBID is a nonprofit overseer of all three organizations. Um, the DMO is overseen by the Tourism Advisory Committee, so their budget and um, annual marketing plan is approved both by the, um, the Tourism Advisory Committee after it gets approval from the uh, DML board. Um, the LBID, which is the downtown district, and the TBID, which is the hotel dollar, $2 a night within the city limits. Um, those are overseen by their um, boards. And then we get feedback from the city commission on those um, annual um, budgets as well as um, the board members that the boards have approved. Um, and so Montana state statutes have, have specific rules for each one of these different kinds of organizations, but they are required to have one executive director. And, um, and so that the executive director myself works at the behest of each of those three separate boards. They have separate missions, funding sources, and um, they still have lots of overlap in working together to work on a sustainable year-round economy for our area while preserving the quality of life for residents and the quality of place and experience for visitors. Um, so we're able to promote all downtown and hospitality businesses without membership fees. Um, our visitor-facing website and social media are Explore Livingston MT and our downtown business-facing website, which really serves um, downtown businesses and social media platforms are downtown Livingston. Are there any questions about that very complicated dynamic? Um, if you could just pause. If you could just pause for one moment, um, Mr. Gager is going to pull up the flow chart really quickly for the commission. 
Thank you. Yeah, it'll mm -hmm. take just a minute. <clears throat> and that way the public can see it also. If you have it ready to share on your computer, uh, because you want that color. I can. What page is that book turned on? There. I think it was in the email. It was in the email attached. It was yeah. in the email. It's um, it's the first page. That is carry your mask. I'm reading it today. I just didn't get through. Oh, oh there no, it is. No. Okay. Okay. So let me move my phone. No, I hit that, I hit that, and then hit that, yes. and then hit share. there. Oh, okay. hit that, and then share. All right. Let me make it bigger. Yes. There. There we go. Perfect. Okay. All right. Thank you, Chris. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, the Tourism Advisory Committee um, is the group that oversees the DMO, but then the other, and we're all overseen by our individual boards with um, feedback from the city on the budgets, as well as board members once the boards have approved those. And um, sometimes there's some confusion. I don't actually control any of this. Um, I work at the behest of regulations and the boards. Mm -hmm. This is where Chris asks if any commissioners have questions at oh, this point. Do any of oh, you have questions at this point? No. Okay. No, I don't. Thanks, thanks, Chris. If you want to continue, we're all yours. Um, so I just have a, the, several, um, and I know it's not in the consent calendar because I usually send this in um, in advance instead of having it um, requested. So there are built my ability to clarify things um, in greater advance. Um, wasn't able, didn't happen because the boards just met uh, last week to go over the budgets. Um, so we would, um, on page uh, uh, three and four, are Chris Pettit, a board application for an opening on the Tourism Business Improvement District. One of our challenges is there's been a lot of turnover in property ownership as well as properties. Um, um, supervision. So we lost um, one of our board members because she left her position. And so another um, general manager was um, proposed as a representative of our only country motor in. And so um, that the board voted on that. And he brings 25 years of experience in the hospitality industry in both smaller and larger communities. The other um, three items um, in this 52 page document um, are the TBIDs uh, fiscal year uh, budget and the DMOs fiscal year budget and um, the LBIDs uh, fiscal year budget. And I have a typo in there that for LBID that says DMO and not uh, LBID. Um, so the TBID is not that we need to change the bylaws to have it be on a fiscal year to coordinate with all the other groups to make it more seamless. So we can do in one annual presentation of all because everything each one of the groups does is overlapping and coordinated. And so it makes a lot more sense, even though it's a lengthy document to do this all at once rather than bit by bit. Um, and so that hasn't happened yet. So this budget is um, for the year 2023 but it is formatted in somewhat to give you a, a coordination with a fiscal year budget. Um, and that is what follows in the um, upcoming pages. So those are the four different items that we would love the commission to give us feedback on. And um, if you would like to vote on that, um, that would be lovely. And then we can take that feedback on back clean up our annual reports with any feedback. And then those will be the public documents that will be available on all our websites. Um, the, the DMO already has um, our annual plan. That's the biggest chunk of this um, on the state website. And um, 
And that is because there's a very lengthy system for the Tourism Advisory Committee to approve that. And then it's reviewed quarterly for as the uh, collections come in, um, as well as we do quarterly um, reports to the state for that also uh, fiscal reports. So I'm not sure not having done this as a big chunk before and um, how you would like to proceed. I'm certainly not going to read all of the highlights of those 52 pages. Um, so I'm not sure what precisely, because I know that um, we want this to be as efficient as possible. Um, if you would like, if you had specific questions about any of those things, if you wanted um, maybe a short summary of highlights about what's been accomplished in the last 12 months, um, challenges in the coming year, um, whatever, whatever format you like, I'm happy to respond to. Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, I would ask you to work with Mr. Gager and he can help outline the process and what would be appropriate for an agenda and action items for the commission or consent items or whatever that looks like. Yes, and I, I would offer that the, um, <clears throat> the city didn't receive materials for the appointment uh, to the board by, of Mr. Pettit. And mm -hmm. so that will come before you on the next agenda, mm -hmm. uh, the approval of that board. So I don't know if anyone has any feedback on the, uh, the annual reports. Those were the, the agendized items. Mm -hmm. So um, if there's none here, uh, you can channel those to me separately after the meeting and I'd be happy to share that with you. Yeah, from my perspective, I look for items to come in Thursday so I can start preparing for the meeting on Tuesday. So I did not have a chance to look over the 52 pages since Sunday night. Um, I would be happy to reach out to Mr. Gager with questions. Other commissioners, does that work for you too? So you have time to work through the. All right, because I haven't yeah. gone through the whole thing yet, okay. either yeah. myself. So Is tried. That... <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, yeah. But yeah, so, I thought yeah. otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> At a glance, it looks great. But mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you, Chris, for putting it together. And we'll all take some time to look it over and take our questions to Mr. Gager. And then I think that'll be the most efficient way. And when it comes to items um, on which the commission needs to discuss or take actions, Mr. Gager can help get those things onto the agenda. Thank, you. Thank you so much, Chris, for being here and putting Chris. it together for us. Great. Thanks. Did any commissioners have anything else they wanted to say? Or are we ready to move on? Move on. Okay, good. 630 so, is coming. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I feel like maybe those two items were wrapped up together, Mr. Gager. Does that seem sure accurate seems like, to you? Yes, Great. That is correct. All right. So next on the agenda is uh, our ordinances. We have three ordinances and one resolution tonight. First up is consideration of ordinance 3043, an ordinance of the city of Livingston, Montana, in chapter 30 of the Livingston Municipal Code entitled zoning by adding section 30.47 entitled plan unit developments and providing a repealer saving severability and effective date uh mr gager is this the comment that came through uh yes the city received a letter uh late this afternoon um, by four p.m or so um, from hrdc and that has been distributed to uh to you all would it be most appropriate for us to take a look at that now? If, if you would like. Before um, you present? I, yes, I, I think it might be worth ready to a minute or two. Okay. Uh, can we just, um, can I just, I just don't want to keep everybody watching us. Like they don't need to sit around watching us while we read. Can I, so can I have a motion for like a five minute recess? So, second. So I think that was a motion by Lyons and then a second by Shorts. Um, for a five minute recess. All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, motion passes. So we'll be back in five after we read this letter. Thank you. All right. So we're resuming our conversation on ordinance 3043. Mr. Gager. Thank you, Chair Newts. The ordinance for you folks is uh, another step in the staff's uh, work to implement the growth policy. As you may recall, um, the adoption of a planned unit development ordinance was one of the 
um, main actual uh, direct recommendations of the, the growth policy. Uh, one of the four um, land use recommendations that was included as our um, the, the priorities in our um, in our February uh, discussion of the, the growth policy implementation. And so uh, I am happy to bring this before you folks tonight for uh, for your discussion um, and and uh, work as we move forward. Jen Severson, the planning director, is is prepared to present on. The ordinance as presented before you, and um, and answer any questions you may have. And um, you know, I guess I will uh, at this point. I will turn it over to Jen, um, and will run us through a presentation that I will share. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, just a little bit while Grant's pulling this up. Yeah, thank you. And um, just some, some brief background um, on this, as uh, Manager Gager said, um, this was an element in uh, Chapter 11 of the growth policy to recommend uh, creating a uh, land unit development ordinance to provide some flexibility for developers um, when coming in with uh, new development projects that um, maybe traditional zoning and regulations don't allow. Um, this, uh, sorry, we did, um, when we started looking at this, um, we looked at several um, PUD ordinances um, for different uh, communities around Montana. Uh, similarly sized, um, have some of the same um, growth pressures as Livingston. We looked at Harbor, uh, sorry, Harden. Um, Columbia Falls, uh, Red Lodge. We also looked at Kalispell. I realize it's a different animal, uh, larger, but just to kind of see um, what was out there, different ranges of things. Um, we did, uh, as far as, as bringing this through the, the process for review before bringing it to you, um, we ran it by a preliminary version, uh, preliminary draft uh, in April to the uh, planning board and the zoning commission. Um, and then we made some modifications based on feedback and also based on some of those other ordinances. Um, and then we brought it to the zoning commission in June um, for a public hearing and they did unanimously um, recommend uh, for you to consider and approve this ordinance. Um, there were a couple of minor changes made after that. Um, and I'm happy to identify those for you if you want, but the, the overall intent and, and the basic premise and the types of, of um, developer incentives and um, recommended public benefits were pretty much the same. Um, we just cleaned it up a little bit. Um, the other thing I just kind of wanted to go over um, is kind of why the need for this um, it wasn't here when the growth policy was developed. Um, and the, the background on why this was recommended is pretty much non-existent in the growth policy. But um, after looking through the growth, growth policy a number of times and reading it, um, I, I can guess um, what that would be um, just based on the goals in it. Um, as I've said um, in the staff report, um, it it can provide flexibility um, needed to make new development financially feasible for developers um, by providing bonuses or incentives, if you want to call them, um, to either increase density, height, and or have the impact fees waive. Um, in return, developers have to provide a public benefit. In this case, we've identified public benefits that we are actively seeking um, in return for those bonuses. Um, and they have been identified in the growth policy as being desirable to increase quality of life for uh, Livingston citizens. Those are affordable housing, reduction of vehicular trips, um, and open space preservation. Um, rather, the way this kind of works is rather than requiring a subdivision normally comes through or development, it, it has strict adherence to uh, the zoning code, um, and design standards. Otherwise, it requests uh, the developer will request 
request a variance if it wants to deviate outside of those. This process sort of um, incorporates all of that in um, and allows for us to look at development and, um, more holistically, um, look at all of the things. Why are you really requesting this um, narrower you know, street? Why are you requesting to sort of move all your development over here? Maybe it's to protect a wetland area or um, a, a viewscape even, or a view shed. Um, so it also integrates, uh, it looks at, at constraints, um, site constraints, which I think is important. You know, um, as we develop, there's less and less raw land available and the raw land that is available often has topographic constraints, has something that makes it more difficult for a developer to develop. Um, a lot of the low hanging fruit is already developed here. Um, so that's just um, maybe not as brief as I intended it, but a background for this. Um, first thing I also wanted to go over is um, in your staff recommendation, um, my mistake, I, I think I focused on three growth policy strategies that align this um, with policy. And there are actually quite a few more. Um, I've included them here. Um, or not. <laughs> the, the folks on Zoom did not see the same thing as the people in the room. So okay. Mr. Gager's making it. No so. problem. Um, I'm going to start with the three that are in your packets. Um, uh, so yeah, um, it's incentivized indeed restricted affordable housing aligns with strategy 5155, which is to... Um, Jen, I'm sorry, can you tell us what page you're on? Just... This is, um, as soon as he pulls it up, it's going to okay. be on that slide. Okay, I'm actually sorry. just, there's strategic alignment that's, that, yeah, there that's we go. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. But Eight, that only 25. has three, and this has a lot more. Or 26, else. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I don't know the page number in your overall packet. Um, so just briefly, um, you know, there, there was the recommendation in general to look at our zoning ordinance um, to allow for higher densities, to know the growth policy promotes infill development over sprawl, and that typically is going to include if you want to develop what the, the space that you already have allocated into the city, then you're probably going to need to increase density somewhere. Um, also, um, promoting growth that, while well, infill still maintains the, the compact historic development patterns that are found in this, the city center, um, typically those are walkable neighborhoods, you have some small scale neighborhood commercial amenities that residents can can walk to and, and have access to easily in their daily lives versus having to drive elsewhere for them. Um, reduced urban sprawl through compact development that's also consistent with the future land use map that's in the growth policy. Um, evaluating transportation impacts of greenfield development that raw land we talked about as part of the development review process so um, you know the further out you're going to develop if you don't have those, those uh, neighborhood scale amenities and, and daily services that people need, they're going to have to drive. So that sort of new further out development is going to increase trips with traditional development and traditional zoning. Um, also in the growth policy, um, explore existing local, state and federal funding mechanisms to aid in the creation of affordable housing. Um, this, you know, we're kind of limited in, in what we can do um, as far as any sort of taxes, any things like that, but we do want to um, incentivize developers to provide us the benefits that we want, right? So affordable housing, as we know, is key, the open space. So this is sort of a mechanism to do that, an exchange of, of what we want and what we'll give them in return. Um, and then on the next slide is also... Um, I did not include it in your packet, but I should have, which is in the housing action plan. The housing action plan, of course, was adopted and was incorporated as an appendices to support the growth policy. Therefore, it is part of the growth policy just adopted later than the original one. Um, and a couple of the strategies in the housing action plan also support this ordinance. Uh, one is establishing incentives or requirements for affordable housing uh, by including density bonuses also flexible development standards. Um, that's part of the PUD is looking at, you know, the, the variation or the variance on our standard um, development standards from public works 
and saying, well, the way that they want to develop this, maybe we don't need those to be the same. The developer has to come to us. He has to explain why he wants that, why it's safe, why it's beneficial when looking at everything that they're proposing is the deviations from the zoning, the standards, all of that. The other one is just general zoning reform. I think we know that we need that. We adopted the growth policy and we have not done a comprehensive up update and reform to our zoning code. We will be doing that um, in the next year or so, um, but this is a way to sort of get that started, um, to find ways to um, encourage developers, incentivize them to, to guide development the way that we would like to see it um, according to the growth policy. Um, so the intent, encourage more efficient use of land and public services, then again, the base zoning, as I'll call it, um, or traditional zoning allows. Um, seven objectives, the fourth one in here, um, was added after this went to the Zoning Commission, um, but I think it just kind of clear things, clarifies things a little more. I don't think it's outside the scope of what they looked at or recommended for approval. Um, objectives, preserve natural and cultural resources, provide open space and recreational areas beyond the minimum subdivision requirements, which is 11% of a subdivision area. Uh, promote a more efficient use of land than the base zoning district would allow, resulting in clustered development and a smaller network of utilities and streets that are required to serve that development. Promote mixed uses in residential zoning districts as a means to improve convenience and access to daily necessities by area residents, which I just mentioned. Um, reducing vehicular trip generation, again, through that mixed use development and enhanced multimodal connectivity, but also by promoting that mix of uses at the neighborhood scale. Um, promoting affordable and workforce housing, um, and then as a general sort of catch-all, if you will, supporting the adopted City of Livingston growth policy. Um, a couple of key things about what we're recommending for um, the characteristics of a planned use, uh, planned use development, minimum size being one acre. Uh, it must include neighborhood scale commercial uses. Um, and we say neighborhood scale, Part of this entire review process is looking at things on a context and site specific basis. So for what, what will be an appropriate neighborhood scale commercial use for one PUD proposal is likely not gonna be the same appropriate neighborhood commercial use for another. Um, and so it does involve some, some, some analysis and also for the developer to bring us more information showing us how it meets these objectives. Um, finally, this is another difference than what went to the Zoning Commission, um, but it supports the objectives listed above, which is we're recommending that they only be allowed, PUDs only be allowed in residential zoning districts. Now, that's not to say that somebody couldn't have, uh, have some property in a, in a district that's not zoned residential and can never have a PUD. They would then go through traditionally what would be required, which is Get, go through a rezoning process first. Mm -hmm. um, I think that could even be incorporated into this process, if you will. Um, it's just rezoning just because you're not able to develop the way you want. Um, overall is not to me an ideal way to go about things. Um, we want to encourage this type of mixed use in residential zoning districts. That's why we're, we're recommending it's just allowed there. But if you have a different one, other than heavy industrial, which we are also recommending, you don't have PUDs there because they can't have the, the residential component. Um, you would just rezone. If that's approved, then you could move forward with um, applying the PUD as the overlay to whatever that rezone district is, if that makes sense. Um, the next one, Grant, please. Mm -hmm. This is the table um, that is in your packet. The only thing that has changed in here, again, since went to since this went to zoning commission, um, originally for in developer incentives, we have residential density bonuses, a height increase, um, and then waived impact fees. Originally, we had recommended a certain percentage of impact fees waived for a certain percentage of the housing that was affordable. Um, 
our building director, as you know, Jim Woodhull used to be the planning director. Um, he actually is more familiar with what the impact fees are currently. He ran the numbers and we discussed it. It just didn't seem like that was enough incentive to just say one fifth up to 25%. Um, and so he ran some numbers and, and realized that if, if we really want to encourage affordable housing, and that's the, I'll get into that in a minute, the 60% or less AMI, there needs to be a big draw. And that's what those waived impact fees, that waived impact fees incentive is only applicable, or we're recommending that it only be applicable to, on a one-to-one -one basis, those housing units that are deed restricted affordable at 60% or less of the area median income. Um, other than that, the, the benefits can sort of be mixed and matched for the incentives, if you will. So we have the public benefits, the affordable housing, um, something I, I tried to make a little clearer after this went to LZC is low income affordable being less than 60% of the uh, area median income and then moderately affordable between 60 and 100% of the area median income. Um, reduced vehicular trips, again, that can be accomplished through site design, mixing the uses, uh, providing more facilities for uh, multimodal transportation options and infrastructure. Um, those would need to be demonstrated clearly by the developer through uh, transportation analysis, including trip generation numbers, um, maybe with alternative designs, what would the trip generation be if we did this in the traditional design versus if you give us this ability, what would it be now? Um, I think that one is, is, is going to be tricky for them to demonstrate, but it's on, for all of these, the onus is on the developer to show the city how they can meet those objectives. Um, and then the increased open space. Again, this is in the growth policy in several places. Um, of that um, increased open space, only 50% can be passive. So if I have an area, and I'll show you at the end if you'd like, I briefly threw together an example of what you could expect to see with some certain parameters of a site. Um, but passive being, if I have wetlands, you're not gonna be able to develop there anyway. So that's passive. I can't use it. I can't build any sort of you know, park facilities there. Um, the rest, so those remain in natural state. If you're gonna do the increased open space public benefit, and that is up the 20% of the total PUD area, half of it needs to be active. So it needs to be a park or it needs to be, um, a trail system or whatever it is, um, it can't just all be a hillside that can't be developed and a wetland or riparian area. Um, for the incentives, again, the density bonus, you can get them in 10% increments, um, but the max is 25% over the base zoning. And that number came about, um, we got some feedback from both the planning board and the zoning commission that um, it was important to respect the base zoning because a lot of thought went into um, determining those densities. And so this way, we're not just saying it's a free for all and you can get you know, 100% over, you know, if you give us enough open space or you give us enough um, deed restricted affordable housings, you can get like an 80% increase and that's gonna change the character of the surrounding neighborhoods likely. Um, which are probably also going to be similar zoning districts, you typically don't have something that's so far off near each other. Um, and so the 25% max respects that base zoning and tries to somewhat maintain that similar character of what's there before the PUD. Uh, the height bonus, we looked at it, there's really no need for it in highway commercial or in the downtown, which doesn't have any height limits, um, or R3. Um, again, we thought for, for R1, it, it may change the character. So we're, we're recommending that it only apply to R2, which I would say the majority of the city is zoned R2 already. Um, and it's a max 40 feet. And that's everything. That's a one-time thing. You can't do like 20% deed restricted affordable housing and get up to 80 feet. It's just, it's just 40 feet. Um, and then finally, the, the impact fees being waived, um, the moderately affordable income, you're still going to get, if you do 10% of your units at that, you're going to get a residential density bonus. But on a one-to-one -one basis, 
um, let's say you do another 10% of those at 60% or less, you get the impact fees waived for those units that are low income, affordable, less than 60%. And then it also counts towards that density bonus. And again, I'll show you again if you want. I, I put those both into that example that I threw together. Um, any questions so far? Do you want to wait till the end? Or? I think we should wait till the end. Um, the next one, please. So this is something we did, this table we put together actually for the Zoning Commission, I believe. It's the same table. It's looking at current density uh, requirements for our zoning districts and um, including height. Uh, so I'll hit on height first because that's the simplest one. Um, those, if you see above at the very top under density, it has low density, the R1, the R2. These are all of the, um, sorry, the residential districts. Um, and for the height, if you go down, it's directly below it. We're only proposing that, that R2 and R2MH, those are the only two districts where that max height is applicable. So it's showing you that yellow highlighted area under height. Right now, the requirement is, is, or the limit, I guess you could say for height is 27 feet, or if you have a roof pitch that's a certain uh, angle, so uh, that's greater than or equal to three to 12, I don't know why it doesn't say one to four, um, then it's 34 feet and that's allowed. Um, the 40 foot max isn't 40 feet and then you get an additional however many feet if the roof pitch is three to 12, it's 40 feet. So at your standard 10 foot tall uh, floor area, like floor to ceiling, you could conceivably have a four story building. I think in today's, the way that things are designed, you're probably looking more at three stories within 40 feet. But for the density, um, the yellow is just on the top part. Those numbers that are in black are showing you what our current density is. So if you look in the table, not we'll go to the units per acre next, but right now, so let's say for the medium density R2 district, the minimum lot area uh, for a dwelling unit is 3,500 square feet. If, if a developer were to come in and provide enough public benefits to get the full density bonus that they're allowed, and that's 25%, you're looking at instead of um, 3,500 square feet, you're looking at it actually goes down in the, in the area of the, the property, right? So 24. 50 square feet is the minimum lot area for that. Um, if you look at it, units per acre, which I think is a little easier to digest for some, um, currently we allow for that 3,500 square foot minimum lot size in R2, that's 12.4 units per acre. Um, with a 25% increase, we're looking at 15.5 units per acre. Yes, we would round up, so it would be 16 units per acre. Um, this is not taking into account primary versus ADUs. Remember, accessory dwelling units do not count against your density requirements. So the way and, and with changes at the state, with laws that are going through, we can no longer limit ADUs in any area that um, allows residential development. Um, so just to put it into perspective though, instead of for the, the units per acre current, if you're talking about ADUs now for medium density, you're talking about 24 per eight or 25 dwelling units. If you have half primary, half ADUs, with a 25% increase, you're talking about 31 units per acre with primary and ADU. Again, assuming that ADU meets the size requirements, meets still has to be within the height requirements, setbacks, all of that other stuff. I'm just putting it out there that that's what we're talking about. Um, so there's others across here. Again, if you just look at the black, it tells you what the minimum is. Um, you know, mixed use, you look at that and you're like, wow, that's a ton of housing per acre. It is. I I'm not sure I anticipate that it will necessarily be worth it for a developer to come through this process and ask for density bonuses and mixed use. They don't need it, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that it would, I think really we're gonna see a lot of this in maybe R1, certainly R2, if, if it comes in and by I say a lot, I mean of, of the applications that will come in because we are limited in raw land um, and the minimum size for this is one acre. Um, I think that we're going to see R2s um, 
that that's going to be the bulk of it. Um, but again, it, it could be used elsewhere. We're recommending anywhere that, that, that we're residential districts according to our code. Um, and, and highway commercial is not on here because there's really no need for this in highway commercial. Um, I think we're done with this slide. Thanks. Um, so just hit some highlights of application requirements that are uh, different than what we currently do um, for, let's say, a subdivision review. Um, so we're recommending that before they and the developers submit an application for PUD, after they've been to a pre-application conference with staff, before they submit their application, <clears throat> um, they are required to notify landowners um, that live within 300 feet of the PUD boundaries um, about the proposed PUD. Um, and they also need to provide a method um, that allows those landowners to offer comments. Um, and not only the comments need to be included in the PUD application, but, and it's not said here, this would be similar to uh, with a subdivision, we have certified mail. We would require a developer to provide us with the certified mail receipts so that we could ensure that these were all sent to who they were supposed to be sent to. Um, and we'd also require a copy of the information they provided. Um, and that's, we're sort of leaving it the way that it's written up to a developer if they would like to put up a website where those landowners can provide comments um, if they would like to host a meeting. Um, the point of this is to not wait so far into the, the application review process to, to let people know what's going on. And this was something that was brought up both at the Zoning Commission and the Planning Board and by <coughs> members of the public that attended those that said it's really frustrating, you know, when, when somebody brings a development through and you get kind of to the, the finish line and then they're finding out about it or then they're, they're getting all the details. And it's really hard to kind of turn that ship around once they've gotten that far. Everybody's like, well, we've invested so much time and staff put in so much time, bless you. Um, so um, that's one of the reasons that we're recommending this. Um, also, the detailed submittal requirements are not shown in the ordinance. They'll be listed in the application form itself. The reason for that, that we're recommending to do it this way is, is these proposals are, are context sensitive. They're, they're site specific. They're not one size fits all, and they're not all gonna need to provide the same information. Um, so, you know, if you have 20 acres of raw land on the north side of the tracks towards the edge of the northern edge of the city, you may need to provide some information that a one and a half acre lot that's being redeveloped you know, on 8th Street would need. Chances are there's not a wildlife corner on 8th Street, um, but chances are there could be something up by the wildland urban interface on the north side at the edge of the city um, that we would want to see additional information. And again, all of this is at the end of the day, you're the developer, you tell me, you provide me all the information. I can make recommendations or I can say, you need to provide this information. You need to provide this so that we understand that this has been addressed or it has been looked at or you're mitigating it. Um, but all of this is on the developer. These are not, this is gonna require a lot more information and a lot more effort, I think, on, on the applicant's part um, than, than possibly a standard subdivision application would. Um, because we're asking them to demonstrate more. Um, and that leads me to the third point of this, which is, um, you know, not just staff, advisory boards, city commission, at any point in the process, if we believe that we don't have um, enough material to evaluate it, to conclusively demonstrate that all these review criteria can be met, the objectives can be met, we can ask for other information. And I think that's a little tricky with subdivision review because of the time constraints. And here it's a little different. Some, some applications may be subdivisions. They may require subdivision and they may need to go uh, adhere to those regulations. But if somebody, one developer has a five acre plot of land and they're not planning to subdivide it, they're just planning to maintain controlling interest then we can work with them and say, well, we don't have that 60 day timeline. We have the timeline that's whatever it takes for you to show us that 
you've met these objectives, you've met this criteria, we're getting the benefits we want, you're getting the incentives for those. So it, I feel like it's really more holistic than what anything that we do right now. Um, this is all in your packet. This has not changed, I believe, since it went to Zoning Commission. Planning Board looked at this as well, the same thing. These are just the general criteria, review criteria. Um, I think the thing to note at the top of both is that um, review criteria is it, this PUD supports the adopted growth policy. So however you need to do that, however we need to see them show that they support the growth policy, it's gonna be different for each PUD, I think. Um, areas that they may wanna emphasize. Um, zoning commission is going to be looking at the rezoning, right? So the, I have a base zoning district. The PUD is going to replace that zone. Some people call it an overlay. It really does replace that base zoning district. Um, and then as part of this review, that's what's determined is what the requirements are for that PUD zoning district. It's going to be different for every PUD. Um, they are going to come in. They're going to have to provide the proposed deviations from that, that base zoning district. So where am I deviating? I'm proposing to have an additional density here. I'm proposing to have 40 foot height limit. Um, that for the zoning commission, they're just looking at the uses, the rezoning, um, the use intensities. Are they buffered adequately? Um, are they buffered within as well as from the surrounding area? Um, the planning board then, um, in a lot of places where they have one group of people that are the zoning commission and the planning board, um, these are reviews done at the same meeting for the city of Livingston, which has a separate zoning commission and planning board. They will be reviewed concurrently, but they, the final review by the city commission um, will be, it'll, it'll the approval will depend on both of them being approved. It's not like you can't approve the, the rezoning part of it and then not approve um, the design part of it or approve all of the design standards part of it and the physical layout, but you don't approve the rezoning. So they both have to be approved. They just go through a separate review process before they get to the city commission. Um, planning board looks at the same types of things that you would for a traditional subdivision review, design standards, infrastructure, layout. Um, again, there's a little more ability, I think, for us with this to look at the growth policy and how that site layout and design um, supports and aligns with, with our goals in the growth policy versus traditionally with the subdivision regs. Um, it's, it's, you have these um, findings of fact, and I, I, from what I've seen, I have not done a subdivision review yet. I'm in the middle of one, but looking at the past ones that we've done, um, you can't go too deep into that, I think. And I, this allows you to bring more of the goals of the growth policy into looking at how that site layout is done. Um, also, looking at, at connections between the surrounding area, uh, the surrounding transportation network, but also within itself. So connectivity, um, you know, are they, one of the objectives is to reduce vehicular traffic, um, promote, um, reduce vehicular trip generation through mixed use development. So it is a requirement if they're going to meet that objective, they need to show us that they're providing you know, maybe multi-use paths within the PUD, um, or they are providing additional bike parking beyond what our standard uh, design standards require. Um, size and type of parkland. Are they providing, maybe they don't want to go with that additional open space, but depending on the size of their PUD, are they really providing adequate park space and recreation space for what they're proposing? So a lot of this really is qualitative, and that's why I say it's really dependent on each specific PUD. It takes a lot more effort and time to review it, um, which is why we're asking so much more of the developers to provide up front. Um, and then again, the, the, the planning board at the bottom, number five, that is really just re-emphasizing those things that you look at as finding the facts for the subdivision. So it doesn't adversely impact the natural environment, 
uh, wildlife habitat, agriculture, public health, safety, and local services. Um, so it doesn't need to be a subdivision, a subdivided PUD for that to be part of the review criteria. <clears throat> um, those will be looked at for all of them. Um, and then the next one, Grant, please. Uh, just some brief points for pre-application. Again, the, we, we typically have a meeting with staff, uh, planning, fire, public works, building. Um, for this one, again, notifying the landowners with 300, within 300 feet and allowing them to comment before the application comes in. That's something that's different. Um, for the application materials, we're asking for the locations and types of uses. These PUDs are gonna have more than one use. Um, they're going to have probably different densities around it. Um, again, they're, they're providing us where they're going to deviate from the base zoning, where they want to deviate from the design standards, how they're going to phase that development, um, how they're going to handle vehicular traffic. And again, this bullet right here in the middle towards the bottom of application materials, this is where that application form is going to be really provide more details about what types of, of documentation um, we will need to see for you to show that you're not, either that you've considered impacts and you're mitigating them or that there are no impacts. But vehicular traffic, multimodal facilities and connections, parking, utilities, parks and open space, landscaping, even operation and maintenance agreements. Um, then also, the, again, the additional support acts that we think are necessary to ensure that you have met the objectives and the criteria. Um, for review and approval of PUDs, um, it needs to clearly demonstrate it furthers these objectives. Um, the work session is something that we don't have currently. Um, we, I saw this in, 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 for sure, I remember Kalispell's ordinance. I thought it was a really unique idea, and I contacted one of the planners in Kalispell that works on these um, to find out what the benefits were of this. And it is just another opportunity after staff begins the review process once the application has come in and before the PUD goes before either of the advisory boards for consideration, the work session is right in the middle. So it is another opportunity for public engagement and to get public input uh, for advisory boards and the city commission. Um, I've, I've run this by Grant, I believe he's talked to um, John about this, but um, it's a listening session just for, for foreign purposes um, to comply with public meeting laws. Um, but it would be similar to, I think, what you may have done for the Shane Center, where you could go, listen, you just can't actively engage. Uh, same for, for the Zoning Commission and the Planning Board. But it is an opportunity for the public to engage with the developer. Um, and it's beyond that 300 foot property owner. This is anybody. They would have to put the work session, the work session would be for the general public. Um, to express concerns, to express, and, and why I think this is important is, you know, if, so you have somebody come in from out of town and they buy a large tract of land and they want to develop and everything sounds nice, and there's a well or there's some cultural resource that only the people that grew up around there knew about, that may not have been considered. I would probably not know about that, but that's the opportunity for people to bring things because that could change the whole layout. That could say, wait a minute, we can't bring this forward to planning or, or the planning board or the zoning board. We need you to go back and show that you're addressing this in the way that you're laying out the site. Um, so again, it's just what we heard was people would like that additional opportunity to provide input and ask questions to the developer before it gets too far along in the process. And then the next slide, please. This is super brief overview to the left, just showing you kind of how this works. It's the pre-app, then the 300 foot notice, then they submit the application, then you've got the work session, then you've got L the zoning commission and planning board doing concurrent reviews. I mean, one may be one week before the other as, as the way that they're scheduled. Uh, but then after they've done their reviews and made the recommendations, then the final is it goes to the city commission for hearing um, and decision. <clears throat> and then um, obviously I'm here to answer questions. If you want me to, the next slide, like I said, it took me about 10 minutes. I threw this together as like the, an example of what you could 
a developer could get with what types of benefits they provide. Mm -hmm. It's pretty simple. I hope I got it all right. Um, but this is, let's say this is a subdivision and the, the site is in the R2 zoning district, so medium density residential. It's a 20 acre parcel. Say it includes two acres of wetlands, right? So as a subdivision, the minimum open space required is 11% or 2.2 acres. And they are proposing 60 housing units. So the public benefits that the developer is going to provide for this is out of 60 housing units, they're gonna provide 12 affordable housing units, which is 20% of the total. Six of those are low income. Go over to the right and look at the developer incentives. So for that 20% of the total 60 units being affordable, they get a 20% density bonus. So 10% on top of the base zoning district density for each of the six uh, uh, affordable units. It, it, so for 12 affordable units times two, 20. That makes sense. I think I put it there right. For the impact fee waiver, that only applies to the low income. So the ones that are 60% or less. So impact fees would be waived for the six low income affordable units, the low income affordable units for on the one-to-one -one basis. Um, for the open space, they have, what do we say? They have 12 acres or 20 acres, two are wetlands. So in order to get um, an incentive, they have to provide, they can't provide 18%, they can't provide 12.2%, they have to jump up to 20 from the 11%. And if they do that 20% of the total PUD area, which for a 20 acre site would be four acres, um, two of those acres, remember are wetlands. So they're passive. The remaining two acres would have to be active open space. They would have to, and that is actually defined in our subdivision regulations um, as, as what constitutes that kind of open space in the, in the ordinance, I actually reference it there. So for that, they could choose for their incentive. If they provide that extra open space, they could either say, well, I want an additional 5% density bonus because they're only allowed a max of 25%, right? So they can't get another 10% because they've already got the 20%. So they can get another 5% for a total maximum density increase of 25%. For some developers, that may be the better incentive. Or they could say, you know what? I want the height bonus, it's in R2. I don't need that extra 5%. I wanna take that 40% or that 40 foot height bonus. So that's what they're getting in return. They've chosen between those two for their open space public benefit. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And I'm, again, I threw that together pretty quickly this afternoon, so hopefully it does. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's it. So that's digest. Please. Questions? Clarifying questions? I'm sure we all have some. So <laughs> who would like to go first? Nobody has questions? I have a lot, but I always start on land use stuff. So okay. I thought let someone okay. else start. Does anybody else want to start? Um, or is clarifying? I don't. Okay. Really. Do you want to go first? Sure. This time. Okay. I don't have time. Um, I think this is probably the, the easiest, quickest question. Um, so when we talk about the developers reaching out to the the property owners to the three thousand or three hundred feet. Is, it is the developer paying for that outreach? Like if it's certified mail, is it the developer paying for that or is it the city? Yep, that is before they have submitted their application. So okay. that is, and again, you're, you're, you know, it, it, you're right. It could be five other property owners. It could be a hundred. Mm -hmm. um, I think that they're probably going to find it to their benefit to pay for that certified mail. 
um, because they can't submit an application unless they show us they've done it. But it is that's why it's it's before they submit their application they would have to. And again, we can incorporate this into the ordinance if it makes more sense to do it this way versus on the application. But we would require them to show us. And we could actually, the pre-app, I take it back, pre-app, we would provide them with a list that I've, I've produced by buffering in GIS, or I've asked Stephen Jay to do it, um, of the property owners that are within that 300 feet of the proposed PUD boundaries, external boundaries. Um, and then we would want to see those receipts. We'd give it to them. We'd say, here they are. We would want to see those certified mail receipts. A lot of times we see certified mail comes back. It's not, it's not signed for, but... They also provide that so that we, I would check that when it comes in for the application, but they've already paid for that. And I don't care what they pay for it. I just want to see that they've contacted those owners. Um, I, I did notice in the, in the letter from HRDC, and I'm kind of curious too, um, did you, were you able to reach out to some developers to get some feedback on this proposal as well? Just curious. Um, I, we had general level discussions with a group of developers that we meet with, um, once a month, um, just for, again, nothing specific to particular projects, but more, um, how are we doing on growth policy? What do you, what do you got going on? That's going to, you know, that, that developers may be interested in. Um, they all seem pretty receptive to this and supportive, um, Again, we didn't go into, I would say, specific details, but this has been out there. It's gone through you know, zoning commission. Um, I would say the June zoning commission is more closely resembling what you're seeing before mm -hmm. you now versus what happened in April. That was just the beginnings, but it's been out there for people to look at. And honestly, I don't think I've gotten any specific questions from them that I can think of about, mm -hmm. well, why not this, or this isn't gonna work. Um, We've reached out to a couple others, um, specific developers that have recent uh, development that they've worked on in Livingston, um, have not heard the one in particular I'm thinking of. I don't think we ever heard back from them. Um, but I think this has been fairly well talked about. And I think my understanding from just discussions with Grant is, is developers are aware of it now. My, my next question is just knowing like what the cost of construction is right now, I'm curious to, to think and I'd love to hear, I mean, when we get to it, maybe from our fellow commissioners, because Commissioner uh, Schwartz might have some thoughts on this. 60% to, to build new at 60% AMI, is that possible right now? That's why we needed this, the, the, and it may not be right now, but that's why the the impact fees we went from certain percentage to mm -hmm. just wave them, wave them on a one to one. Um, I I don't know if it's enough, and I think that maybe the benefits that are more attractive to developers will probably change as conditions change. Mm -hmm. um, but that if 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 out of these public benefits we've identified, if we really want to try to incentivize. Mm -hmm. affordable housing. And I don't mean, you know, yes, 60 to 100% is affordable, but for low income affordable, that's really hard to incentivize. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to take suggestions for another way to do that or additional ways to do that. But like I said, for, for that, you're actually kind of getting two incentives. You're getting for, for, for each low income affordable unit, you're not only getting the waiver of development fees, but it's counting also towards your density bonus if that makes sense so those are the only ones in there that are counting just anything over 60 percent or 60 percent to 100 percent is only counting towards your your density bonus but those um 60 percent or less ami units are getting both and so that may be enough incentive it's counting towards the, the density bonus and you're getting a waiver of, of impact fees i think i have one more and then i think i'll let other folks so um, you didn't really touch on this, but I feel like we've seen this. Um, we saw this before I was on the commission, but if, 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 if someone goes through this whole process and they, they get approved and then they never start construction, at what point is that 
proposal null and void. Is it three years? For subdivision, I believe it's five. Um, for this, if it's not a, if for now for subdivision, we have to comply with that. Now, I actually would um, ask the city attorney if if we were able, if, if that was something that was considered with, if, it, if a developer chooses to go through this process, if we can require maybe a waiver of the five years and to make it the three years, like we're saying for all non-subdivision PUDs. Um, that said, um, it is in here. Um, we, and for a lot of this, when you, when you notice that we, we refer to subdivision regs, it's because we didn't want to try to create an entirely new um, regulatory system for these. Um, so we tried to piggyback on what's already out there. Um, but for filing a final, let me find it, sorry. Uh, I know it's in here because I've been asked this question before. The intermittent expiration of the PUD. So that's letter mm -hmm. I, I think it's the last section. Um, so if they don't involve a subdivision or if they do, let me get that one first because there's only one point. Basically abandonment or expiration for right now, we're just saying if, if it involves a subdivision, you have to follow the subdivision rules. If it doesn't, um, if it involves out of compliance with its completion schedule or um, if they don't submit their progress updates um, to the zoning administrator, which is defined in the code as me, as the planning director. Um, then the notice of non-compliance, the city will issue that. They have 30 days um, to submit a written request for time extension. Now, I am not expecting 100 PUD applications to come in. Um, if, if there is, then, then we have some other things probably to discuss. But um, for now, as PUDs are approved, since it's just me, I will note the date, I will go to my calendar and I will mark it for here's when your one year is up or here's your completion schedule. I need to follow up. I need to make sure that something's going on. I'll talk to, to the building department and say, have they applied for building permits for this? Um, they submit that. Um, the way that we have recommended it is that the commission, the commission must grant the extension. Um, and you may grant one or more um, and, and the language, this was tailored to follow what subdivisions do. Um, we left it up to sort of open-ended for the commission at the time and the specific situations for that development to decide um, what's necessary to address the issues that are the reason why they're not completing it in time or they're not on schedule. Um, I, at the planning board, I was asked, you know, well, why don't we want to limit how many extensions can be given? And I think I'm hesitant for that because things can change so quickly. We could go into another recession. Somebody may have a large scale PUD and they're, they're, they have multiple people involved in it and somebody dropped out. So I think for different situations, it may be that, that somebody that the commission deems that that merited that they get more than one extension. Mm -hmm. So that's the recommendation, but you could certainly make it so that they only get one to one and done. But it's on the zoning administrator to make sure as it's written that they are complying with that and they are completing it as they have, as it's been approved. Each one will be different. If I have a phased PUD in five phases, that's a way different completion schedule and that's all written into the final approval um, it's in the final development agreement as to how that's happening so that everybody has a clear expectation of, of, of how it's going to be constructed <coughs> and completed. Um, and I think that's important too because surrounding landowners, um, they, they want to know what's happening. When am I expecting construction? Like if you're you know, doing this little bit up front and then you're waiting another four years, which you could approve, if that's the way you approve it in the schedule, to start something else, that may be an issue. We may be worried about weeds. We wanna put something in there that says, hey, you have to whatever, maintain the property until you start this. So it's, the ability is there to grant the extension. For abandonment, um, basic, it's also in here. Um, when they have failed to get the extension from you, they've abandoned it. When that happens, um, anything that's been developed, 
um, those conditions and approvals stay with the property. Um, anything that's not developed resorts back to the base zoning district or moved from the PUD. But that will never happen. Do you want me to go next? Yes. I, I don't want you to be on the hook to always have to. <laughs> Hopefully, something we cross off your list from the you know, from the rest. Doubt it. <laughs> I'm looking at notes. <laughs> okay. I do have questions. Um, I'm just going to start because I wrote them down as I listened to you. Um, so, you said that there's an analysis for what is appropriate for neighbor neighborhood commercial scale. Um, can you give us insight onto what that analysis, like what is that analysis? I, I think what I intended to say, if it wasn't what I said, was that there, there will be analysis on a case-by-case -case basis. So what is appropriate for one PUD, a one acre PUD, again, in, in, in an already developed area of the city, may not be the same. And, and again, each has to have some commercial component, but a larger PUD in an area that's, that's raw land, we may say, you know what, having a single office for whatever uh, service is not really appropriate for this. Or again, for the small PUD, if somebody's like, hey, I want to put in um, some sort of, you know, I hate to say manufacturing, but whatever's allowed there, but on a larger scale, mm -hmm. that really is just taking up, you know, they may have one one residential unit and then everything else is that, that's not really appropriate. So either. you mean whatever is allowed there in the underlying zoning? I mean, it, it may not be because again, this is changing your zone. Okay. So it's appropriate for what's being proposed as part of the PUD. So I'm the reason I'm asking this one is I'm anticipating the public's interest. And so um it sounds like staff is going to get it as close to great as possible or as close to palatable for the public as possible and then it will go through like the zoning and planning process where the public will have another chance to engage and hopefully like it all lines up like well, yeah. the public yeah. and all branches of government before it comes to the commission right is that what the goal is here with like the staff analyses. I just want to make sure I'm clear because this is really different. And I think yep. the first time this happens, the public is going to ask a lot of questions. So it's good to just sort of lay it out right now. Like there will be yeah, a, a thorough offer, staff review before it ever gets to a public body. And I would offer that there's even steps before that in the pre-application meetings for the community and the public to the know, work session, the pre pre application the project okay. with the applicant. Great. So I just want to make sure people understand yeah. that it'll be transparent and interactive, and the staff will be working hard to really get it the public interest like incorporated before it ever absolutely the application would, comes through. Any I would time. offer that it's not. I, I don't want to say that it's it's the staff is kind of making it so it's palatable it's up to the developer to show us how it's going to be palatable and part of that public input is to say we don't really feel like you know um a machine shop or or somebody's whatever uh, um producing woodworking and it takes you know all these mm -hmm. tools that make noise we don't really feel like that's appropriate in our our one district so that doesn't mean that's the final say but that that can inform it and and hopefully you know a smart developer is going to listen to to some extent the people surrounding it that are going to have to live around that development um and 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 what they think is appropriate and now again that i, I would say the expertise that kind of comes in is also staff is looking at that mm -hmm. the different advisory boards are looking at that you're looking at that we're all looking at it from a bit of a different lens but you know, then that goes back to sort of the growth policy, future mm -hmm. land uses, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Does Thank that... you. No, yes, that's an important distinction. Thank you for clarifying. That's very helpful, I think. Thank you. Okay, the next is, um, I just, you mentioned that a developer could ask to have land rezoned. Um, potentially that could be part of this process, although it sounds like it's not right now. So I just wanted clarity that it is not part of the process right now. And rezoning something is a very different process than what before us is that correct yes mm -hmm. and we may want okay. to keep that separate I we just, may want to 
you know, part of that is, is helpful, I guess, for a developer to say, we can kind of one-stop shopping, do it all in a yeah. row. We can do the rezoning first and then move on. But it may be, again, you know, instead of having this built in and already like, okay, the rezoning is gonna happen here or at the same time, it may be that we wanna keep it separate and say, you have to rezone first. Mm -hmm. I don't know from a developer standpoint, how palatable that is because how far into a PUD design do you wanna go if you're not sure that that land is gonna be rezoned to make that work? Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I and again, we're really only talking about non-residential districts because if you're in a residential district, you don't need a rezoning. Mm -hmm. This is the rezoning. Okay, next, thank you. I'm gonna keep moving through because I have a lot of questions and I'm, I'm putting myself in good competition with Commissioner Lyons for my length of, <laughs> for my number of questions. Um, I, this is more of a, I'll save this for deliberation actually, that one. Um, you mentioned, um, I quote, we can't develop there when you referred to wetlands riparian areas. I would like to hear a little bit more about that. Since I've been on the commission, that's been a topic of conversation. And so I'd love to hear your perspective when you're saying- to develop in wetlands here? I mean, I there's so. a lot of things that, there's places where there's pressure to build here. And I think wetlands are a topic of conversation in addition to other areas that might be controversial. And so I'm just curious, is there some regulations? That would be surprising to me. And again, I have not been through subdivision review coming from Louisiana. It's a pretty big no-no to develop the wetlands. And well, I thought that was a federal thing, well, but I think there might be more conversation to have. I don't want to, do you want to wait yeah. for deliberation or? Yeah, I'm just wondering if the word you're using is not. It's defined differently? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That yeah. could be. That's what I think. That could I be. think that the word you're using is not. <laughs> well, and certainly riparian yeah. areas, there's and for, a lot of pressure. They, well, to there's that, areas. that is a little more, but for this, for purposes of this, the thing is you could tell somebody for this, I, I've agreed to go through this process. All right, it's not appropriate for you to develop there. Again, this is this is a little different than your traditional. So, okay. um, since one of the objectives, right, is to preserve natural resources, mm -hmm. they're not meeting that objective if they're proposing development in a sensitive area that would allow for development technically, but is maybe not the best way to go about it. From from my experience, different people have different perspectives on what's worth preserving, and so. I think maybe that'll I'll bring up some things when we get to deliberation because I don't want to. Yep. It's nope. more important, uh, more appropriate there based on previous. And I'm sorry if I misspoke because I I no nope. Jen I think I think uh, Vice Chair Kellen sure know. is right that there's probably mm -hmm. a technical definition that I'm not considering. Okay. Um. So mixed use I didn't see it on page 31, but is that what did show up in your presentation? So mixed uses would be included. As a residential use, or did I miss it? Yes. It's in the packet and I missed it. I believe we allow it now. So page it 31, is, C2, I don't see is it. Is it not? Mm -mm. Okay. Oh, I know what that was. That was before we brought it down to this to only residential districts. So I'm trying to think of our density table. We don't actually have residential and commercial districts defined as residential and commercial. The only way they're sort of allocated that way in our zoning code is the density tables. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm trying to think of mixed uses on it because that slide was done before we restricted it to this. So the important thing for me to know, I guess, is, is mixed use being included in this? Or? I would say no. Okay. Because you. they don't need it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So I'm sorry about that. No, it's okay. Um, we're all good imperfect question. humans, and I appreciate that we have the numbers, even if it's not included, because it helps inform us. So um, thank you for the clarity on it. Um, that one will save for deliberation. Sam's skipping through things. Mm -hmm. 
Did you see that during the process it has to pass at the zoning commission and the planning board to make it to the city commission? So those again, just kind of a reminder. I know you know this, but for for others, it's nothing is approved by an advisory board, right? right. They can only recommend it. Correct. So one could recommend denial, and the other could recommend approval because you're the final decision makers. Right. But you cannot approve one part of it. Now you can conditional. You can you can condition the approval, but you can't say blanket no rezoning but we like your your site design concept so they, they basically because they're they're in two separate areas one is a rezoning one is the development uh plan review or if it's a subdivision preliminary plat they have to be considered separate but they both have to be approved i don't so Basically, just to make sure I understand, so we could get different recommendations from the different bodies, and the commission is going to have to figure it out. Well, I think it's it's you have the ability. My, my understanding. Yeah, you're great at this. Go for it. So, the this term rezoning is actually helping me to understand it. Rezoning is a requisite part. Mm -hmm. of the process mm -hmm. so there's the base zoning let's say it's r2 mm -hmm. in order for a pud to be considered the zoning commission has to decide to rezone this parcel as pud is that correct and so the, so yes. and so if if the zoning commission rezones it pud which also has to be responsive to the original base zoning. Mm -hmm. Then it makes it to the commission, kind of regardless of the the up or down vote of the planning board. But it sounds like there's really a that the, the zoning commission kind of has does have a yes no kind of power over this with with approving the rezoning to PUD from the base zone. So recommending the approval. Of yes. The um, it and if, if they were to say, color. right, if yes. they were to say no, then it doesn't advance that's to that's the that's commission. That's if the zoning commission says no, don't, don't rezone to PUD. It can still go through. Okay. Because that's the recommend, that's the recommendation. We just have to, or not we, but the elected body, whoever the five people are, have to like resolve something in order to approve it. Correct. Or? I will say that other um, places that have this have a single, they operate separately, but it's the same people that operate as their zoning commission and their planning board, which does so, make it easier. So we don't have that. So I'm we curious about, so I'm curious about like if the zoning commission says no, but they don't have the ultimate authority. And planning board does not have the ultimate authority either. Correct. And the planning board, what were you going to say? So what I think is, because, you know, you were talking about there's kind of these two things, right? And so let's say planning, we, we get a recommendation from the planning board for the site plan and what this is going to look like. Yeah, physical and what's layout it involved, right? And then we get a recommendation from the zoning commission about we're making this a PUD. What we can't do is we can't say no PUD, but we really love this plan and yeah. we're going to move yeah. the plan forward. I think is what she was. Okay. I, yeah. I think is yes. what Jen and, was and getting at. Part gotcha. of the rezoning isn't just saying it's a PUD, right? It's, right. it's the use intensities. It's the deviations mm -hmm. from the zoning. So if, you know, planning board, they don't, they don't thoroughly evaluate their, their purview is more the physical layout of the infrastructure. And then zoning is looking at, they're gonna look at those deviations, right? Like, hey, we're giving you this, so we want an extra 10%. That's a deviation from the zoning. That 40 foot, that's a deviation from the base zoning. So they may say, well, we're not, we recommend the PUD, but we don't recommend the 40 feet. Well, if the site layout is dependent on that 40 feet of height, then there's kind of a disconnect. And unfortunately, the way it's set up now, it, it really does fall on you. If there's one that approves and one that doesn't, or they make conditions that don't really, it is ultimately on the city commission. Okay, that's what I need to hear. Thank you. 
Is that what you wanted to hear? Or <laughs> yeah, I mean, I want to hear what's true. You know what I mean? I want to hear what's real because yeah. that's the right. position we find ourselves in yeah. all of the time on land use decisions as a commission is how hard can we make it? That's what's going to come in front of us. So yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. is there anything you wanted to add to that before I move to my next question, Commissioner Lines? No, uh, great, great job. But that, that discussion helped me as well. Okay. So, and that, um, then I have one question based on your example. So if a developer increases density, like if one of their benefits is they got an increase in density, right? Mm -hmm. That was one of their, one of the bonuses they got, the yeah. developer, incentive, uh, mm -hmm. developer incentive. So now they can put more housing units in the piece of land or on the piece of land. Mm -hmm. Are they now required to increase the number of affordable houses to maintain that 10%? No, because the 10% is what gets them that bonus. I just wanted yeah. to make sure. It's that the 10% before they get the bonus. Yeah, I just wanted to make yep. sure. Nope. People are going to ask that. So nope. that's gonna totally. That's it for me for now. Commissioner Lyons. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. <laughs> um, you know, uh, this is, I think this is tough and for all of us. So mm -hmm. um, nice job. Um, first question is actually maybe for Grant and not for Jen. Um, do we have, do we have two more meetings on this? Um, what's the process for this? Cause it, it's, it's, it's listed as a, like for consideration. And then there's a public hearing. Is there then a final reading? What um, is the what's the process? So the the plan is if if you folks um, approve this tonight, we would have one more meeting. Um, second reading of the second. Yeah. And the okay. Public hearing. The Great. second reading is the public hearing. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Is that thirty days? Um, it's yes. not less than fifteen not less days. Than, not less than thirty. First reading to second has to be. Right. It would. Yeah, that's we what are planning the for the yeah the yeah. fifth of September. So. And so just to add on that, I don't believe you have to. It's not like a, there's not a time. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you could. Sorry, we didn't, I didn't mean to. Sorry. Oh, that's all right. Oh, that's good clarify. Mm -hmm. um, my next question is kind of related. Um, would you please remind us what the opportunities have been for public input on, on public and including uh advisory board input on this yes. so far yes um so i brought it to the planning board and the uh zoning commission back in april um and it was uh pretty preliminary um we were asking for input what would you like to see what does it make sense um it had a lot of the same i mean the intent was there the objectives were there um we had not yet distilled down our kind of idea identified the key public benefits and the incentives and, and that formula yet. Um, but it was discussed that, you know, what kind of would you like to see? Um, then um, we did not go back to the planning board. We brought it, we, we made the revisions, we cleaned it up, we toned it down um, and uh, meaning just kind of made it a little clearer um, because we were starting to get a lot of additional details in it. Um, and, and so, Again, that sort of morphed over into let's put these in the application form. And what you see before you now is pretty darn similar to what went before the Zoning Commission at their June 13th meeting. Um, they unanimously recommended approval. And you know, I would say the key thing are the, the only in the residential zoning districts that was added after that. Um, the uh, I believe the requiring a commercial component was added after that. Um, and then the change in the impact fees, instead of that percentage, we went and said less than 60% and we defined that low income and moderate income and said less than 60% AMI, that is going to be a one-to-one -one waiver of impact fees. That came after LZC saw it. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, On page 31, um, which is section D, it says to achieve the stated intent, 
a PUD shall further the following objectives, mm -hmm. and that lists those seven objectives. The way that I read that shall further the following objectives, that would require that all seven of those objectives need to be furthered um, by the PUD. Am I reading that correctly? Uh, that's what I would say. Um, that is how it was intended. Looking at this, that's a good point. I don't think it can be. I mean, yeah, because not everybody will choose to have um, the affordable housing component. I mean, I hope they do. Um, there may not need to be, um, and and maybe it should, um, you know, support the following objectives. And then it's sort of, you tell us how you're able to do that. In some cases, I don't think for natural resources, maybe there's a parcel that doesn't have any natural resources concerns or they're not proposing to put anything there anyway. So it's a moot point, but I, I see what you're saying. And I think that that needs to be changed. Yeah, and I think, I think that the way in which that changed is gonna have a massive impact, impact on the outcome of the PUD. Um, and that now we're kind of getting into deliberation, so I'll bring that up again later. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll I'll revisit that later. Okay. Um, so there are like to that end, there are specific thresholds for public benefits uh, assigned throughout. For example, um, ten percent deed restricted affordable workforce housing. Um, I'm curious where those thresholds came from. Uh, I think it was kind of a combination of what I saw in other um, ordinances. Um, it also was to try to simplify it. Uh, one ordinance I looked at had a very complicated formula that I did not think was very straight formula for different percentages of an incentive according to the different AMI levels. Um, it just, it, for the amount of, of what I think are PUDs we're gonna see from this, it seemed like a bit complex. So the 10%, I think was something that, and I, again, I'm sorry, I would have to go look back so at the, that initial the, stuff that I looked at. That was just an example of the yeah. questions kind of more general as to where those thresholds were. All of from. this, I would say came from the, the, the waiver and the impact fees I think actually we just came up with that on our own as an incentive. I don't think I saw the, the impact of the optional <coughs> waiver in, in the four or five ordinances I looked at closely. Um, the height increase is a pretty standard one. And when uh, we looked at the current zoning map, um, again, there's no need for a height increase in, in R3 for, um, yeah. But, and in R1, we thought it might be a little too impactful to the surrounding neighborhood because it is a lower density. It is, so we, we, we decided, staff, um, that limiting it to R2 district and maximizing that at 40 feet was allowing a developer to add another floor of units but it didn't seem like it was too far above the base zoning to, to really drastically change um, the site and, and impacts to the surroundings. So it, a lot of this honestly was review of other um, ordinances, but also staff consideration based on our knowledge, our experiences and what we thought might work and not work for Livingston. Um, you know, I, I have kind of a general policy that I that I trust staff expertise because that's why you you have the position that you do. So I appreciate that. And I don't think that that's like an invalid part of the process. It's an important part of the process. Um, but I do actually want to get into one specific or ask a question about yeah. one specific one of those thresholds, which is um, on section three multi-phase development and there's a stipulation of at least five percent of the total affordable workforce housing must be included in the first phase um 
I think I kind of need to include a tiny bit of deliberation in this question. Mm -hmm. um, I could envision a phasing scheme that puts off the development of affordable housing units. Um, you know, if we're talking about a, a five year development cycle, you, you brought up the, the point of the business cycle and where we might be in the business cycle. Right now, we're in a hot part of the business cycle and housing is super expensive. And so if I were a developer, I would do 5% this year, phase one, and then phase two is next year. And I do 5% again, assuming that next year is going to be hot too. And I would just put off the development of that affordable stuff until the market came, came down. So um, how can we avoid that, that kind of scheming? Yep, certainly. And I... Honestly, looking at this again, I'm not sure that actually even needs to be in there because the next one down requires that the developer, the developer bonuses are implemented at the same time as the benefit that's, that they, they provided to get that bonus. So if they're providing affordable housing in order to get a certain bonus and they want to construct that, you know, the, the additional height or what they have to provide the, the benefit. Does that it does. make that, sense? And yeah. so I don't even know, honestly, the more I think about this, I don't even know if that at least 5% it probably should needs be. to be in there. Can I ask a question? Go for it. So by definition, there must be some bonus, right? For phase one, otherwise folks wouldn't be going through a PUD. There's something, there's some incentive developers are getting, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise they wouldn't do this process. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure I'm like keeping yeah. up. Yeah. And I think we were also, the reason that 5% came about, if I'm remembering correctly, um, is, is we were thinking more for a lot of these um, that we have seen and we kind of looked at, um, just people load up on the infrastructure improvements at the beginning, maybe, for a PUD. Um, and so we didn't want it to be all about that. And then, oh, we lost our money and we haven't done anything else. But I think because we put in the, that line below it, mm -hmm. we could probably just Nix, I would five percent. I would think so. In yeah. fact, I think that they might contradict each other, so it would probably be cleaner without it. Thank you. Um, so this one it might just demonstrate my ignorance, and my apologies for um, potentially being ignorant on it. But um, you know, let's see. On page thirty-two, uh, um, public benefits talks about. Uh, affordable housing, the definition of affordable housing mm -hmm. being at or below 60 AMI. Mm -hmm. What I think that that means is affordable to someone whose yeah. income is at or below 60 AMI, 60% AMI, which would mean 30% um, of, of the annual income of that individual. Um, am I interpreting that correctly? I believe not. Okay. Um, so area median income is, um, it's determined at the park county level, so at the mm -hmm. county level, it is uh, updated, I believe, annually through HUD. Mm -hmm. So it is assigned for a region, in this case, the county, um, but it is not, it is, and, and I, I would have to look into how it's done. I use the language in here, um, mm -hmm. but it's not... <laughs> Plus, um, it's not like having it or at 30%. It's there, there's a formula. And rather than listing it in here, of if this is your income, like right now, I think the AMI is 53,000. Um, depending on rent or ownership, I think there's a, there's a, there's a calculation involved. And we can reference that here, but it's something that's found in like um not the census information but there's I I, it's, um, commissioner kale knows what i'm talking about uh, it's it's not the census it's the american community survey well that's how they come up with the numbers but it's listed it's in the amounts through my HUD. people may no but it's the place that it's identified is is it's through hud and it, it's at park county like if you go to their website there's a place and i I, I'm sorry, I can't tell you it, but it is a pretty standard term, but it, it's not automatically like 30%. So 
I think maybe the wording could be improved here because um, I I don't read it meaning what you're talking about. Um, and maybe maybe that just means maybe that's again maybe that's from my ignorance, but I, my interpretation of this is not what what you're explaining to me. So that again, I could just be wrong. But um, then I have one more follow up question, and we can we can move on. Um, and that is pertaining to rental. So how would that like? So I'm thinking of a scenario in which an invest like we're, we're talking about as a unit of a unit within the PUD mm -hmm. and an investor who is not at 60% AMI, right? Someone who wants to buy the unit okay. or wants to buy the unit to develop it for affordable housing. Can a can an investor buy the unit and then and then rent it at an affordable rate. Yeah, it's it's the it's the what it's put on the market at, I guess. And I don't I will be fully honest. I think I would feel comfortable and better able to answer your questions if I maybe could collaborate with somebody at HCRC to kind of find out the guidelines. This is more their their area than mine. A lot of this was taken language from other ordinances, but no, it's not about the investor, whether they are at an AMI or not. It's, it's however it goes on the market and it would need to be deed restricted. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Does that? Yeah, that's fine. Because the deed restriction takes care of that. Yeah. Um, oh, and I, I skipped, I skipped one question that I think is important and then I'm finished. <laughs> so thank you for bearing with me. No, please. Um, this is all helpful. <laughs> Pages of sun. Um, it's right in the beginning. Oh, here we go. On page twenty-seven. Um, again, we we it's a it's a list of the objectives. So this isn't from the ordinance, but rather in the staff report. Um, the August first staff report or the LZC staff. Zoning. It's it's dated okay. June thirteenth. Okay. Um, Sorry, mine aren't list numbered the same. I don't have the full packet. Um, it says to promote more efficient, this is again, one of the objectives, promote more efficient use of land than the base zoning district would allow, resulting in clustered development, mm -hmm. which is great, and a smaller network of utilities and streets. I think that adjective of smaller doesn't really make sense to me, and I'm kind of curious what smaller would mean, because like a smaller network of utilities could mean like a smaller dynamic. Some smaller diameter. Uh, then we can just say less extensive if that's better. It's well, so I actually think if you were to look at at um, downtown Livingston and you look at that gridded street network, yeah. someone that might describe that as a bigger network, um, a bigger street network. So I think um, we, we might want to consider what the intent is there um, because. It, more more efficient or or higher accessibility are things that would make sense to me um but you smaller is dense kind of, or more we're condensed. less infrastructure so less costs you may if you're clustering development you're not going to need the same street infrastructure right that's what we're that's what i'm, I'm explaining what we're we're meaning okay. the intent of what we're trying to say okay. so if we're not then we definitely you said the get more efficient may be a term that yeah, you find it be more descriptive. Yes, I yes. Well, you're you're condensing the but condensing. The I mean, well, that's like, not right either. But yeah, because you could you could say doing a a single street with a cul-de-sac is conden condensing yeah. the network, and I don't that's think true. any I don't think that would be in line with the growth policy. So um, efficient might work better, but I I kind of think that that needs a little bit more thought to to produce the the intended outcome okay we can do that um, sure. and you mean that for streets as well right just to be clear like i, I kind of specifically for example, need me for example for alleys and grid network <laughs> yeah. yeah like yeah. it's not necessarily less but it's more efficient yep okay yep. and that is that those are all my questions for you right now okay Thanks, Jen. Yeah, no, you're welcome. We're well past you. our seven o'clock break. So I'm going to suggest we take a break before we come back.
and do a motion and I'm out of water, so or yeah. <laughs> or just before we do anything else, period. So will someone make a no motion, please, for a 10 minute break? I'll make a motion that we take a 10 minute break. I'll second that. Motion by Kale and a second by Schwartz. All in favor say aye. 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 Five zero. See you in 10. Oh. <laughs> so I want to check in quick on process since it sounds like we might have a lot to talk about in deliberation and I don't want us to find ourselves with like strange but in a strange spot in terms of motions and amendments and all of that so Mr. Gager we need to take public comment and also the um Commission, it sounds like it's going to have some significant, meaningful input or feedback that we want based on mm -hmm. the conversation I heard so far. Mm -hmm. Would you like us to make a motion right now, or is it better? Is it better process right now to do the public comment and then deliberate so you can get a sense of where the commission's at before we do a motion? Yeah, I, I actually might offer, given how the conversation has gone so far, that it might be worth. Uh, you folks opening up to public comment because it just without making any assumptions or, or guiding you either way it does seem like there probably is some revision that is likely to occur okay. as a result of the de deliberations tonight so um, perhaps best to get the maximum input before a, a motion is made and and recognize that you know if, uh, if, if no motion is possible tonight um, you folks can certainly give us direction uh, and then jen and i can we could uh, you know, continue the hearing to, to next meeting and bring back a revised board okay. that uh, meets the needs of the commission. And if I'm misreading, I agree with that. Yeah. If I'm misreading the commission, let me know. But I, okay, it sounds. But that's like the way I, I, could, I, I, I yeah. don't. We're not going to vote on this. I don't. Yeah, okay. I don't see a vote. Okay. Happening. It needs to go back and. Yeah. HRDC needs, but you know, add their two Can cents. That? Four tonight. Okay, just yeah. Right. But yeah, we'll so, definitely take public comments. I'm gonna open this to we'll start with people in the room. Um I wanna just start with public comment for people in the room, then we'll go online. Mm -hmm. Um so opening to public comment for folks in the room on ordinance 3043. If you could just start with your name and address. Thank you. Great. Uh, good evening, commissioners and city staff. Uh, my name is Catherine Daly, and I'm here on behalf of HRDC this evening. I reside at 520 South 9th Street here in Livingston. And thank you so much for the opportunity to review and comment on this uh, proposed PUD ordinance. I know how much work it is to get um, regulations pulled together. Um, so again, kudos to city staff for making this happen, and my apologies for not being available for the June meeting and getting this comment in under the gun. Uh, thank you again to city staff for printing it and passing it out. That's super helpful. Um, for those that don't have paper copies, I will <laughs> summarize my comments. But before I forget some of the discussion that the commission has had tonight, I want to respond to some of the comments that I've heard come up. Uh, and then I'll just go into a review of my letter if that sounds appropriate. Okay, I'm seeing nods. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's great to hear um, that city staff is meeting with developers once a month and that they seem receptive and that this regulation has been out there. So that's, that's positive. And um, it sounds like maybe getting a little bit more um, uh, sort of focused feedback on some aspects of this could be helpful. Um, one question that the commission had was just, can people build at uh, for folks with incomes at 60% area median income or lower? Um, the answer is yes, but those developers will very likely need to take advantage of low income housing tax credits. And those projects take a little bit longer to get into the hopper because they have to be requested, particularly if the developer is trying to go for these higher 9% low income housing tax credits. That is a competitive process. Um, currently, HRDC is actually in that process for a development in Bozeman. Um, with a developer called Boundary that has expressed interest in doing a project in Park County. 
So we're hoping to sort of continue to usher that project through and then look for opportunities in Park County, ideally for another 9% low income housing tax credit project. But again, that takes up like a while to get through. So it won't be, they won't be showing up with an application in November. <laughs> um, who pays for certified mailers? Um, developers always should, or the applicant always should. That should either be factored into your application fee um, or some, some other way. Um, you can do it according to the number of mailers sent out. Uh, something I might recommend is that they also submit a form verified by the clerk and recorder's offices that all the addresses are current. Um, and so then the planning department has a record of all the addresses that uh, mailers have been sent to. They know that it's the most current addresses on file. Um, that could be very helpful for your efforts. Um, uh, addressing the language that Commissioner Lyons brought up um, at the beginning of the ordinance, sort of teeing up all the objectives rather than shall, you could consider something like the purposes of this ordinance include the following objectives, X, Y, Z, et cetera. Um, questions about area need and income. It is set by the Department of Housing and Urban Development annually, according to geographic area, it's Park County for us. Um, they do it, uh, they publish what are known as income limits and they provide a summary of those. And those are set for according to the number of people within a household. And so they publish those income limits for folks with households of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. <laughs> and then you can sort of extrapolate from there. Um, currently for this year, the median family income, so for a household of four in Park County is actually $89,200. Um, uh, they categorize very low incomes, so those folks earning 50% or less of the area uh, median income um, as, let's see, for a household of four, that would be $43,750. Um, we know that in Park County, we have smaller household sizes, typically around two people. So for two people, a very low income uh, household would be bringing in $35,000. Um, so that's how that works. Um, something I was mentioning to Commissioner Kale during the break was that there are also um, differences in the amount of income that renting households and households who own their properties are bringing in. And so that is also something to consider when you're trying to target affordability. If you're trying to target a renting population, they are gonna have uh, likely lower incomes than those who are trying to own. Um, let's see. Catherine, that's the four minutes. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, are you able to be succinct and then we can, thank you. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, Regarding the comments from the commission about whether some of these incentives will be useful, I have heard anecdotally from some developers that they could use relief when it comes to impact fees, which are included here, um, and infrastructure costs, which for certain developments are addressed in recent House Bill 819. Um, I agree, next to 5%, that provision following it was something that we support. Um, and then regarding wetlands, a permit is required from the US Army Corps of Engineers to work in waterways and wetlands. Um, and so something that you might include in your application requirements or wetland, de wetland delineations. Um, okay, general comments covered in the letter we submitted. So generally we appreciate and support uh, the city of Livingston's efforts on this. Um, and we commend the city for creative incentives for the creation of housing affordable residents earning no more than 100% AMI. Um, let's see, I'm just going to skip ahead to some key points. I think some of the most key recommendations for us are consider creating a new objective, um, promoting the diversification of our community's housing stock. We talked about the small household sizes and the preponderance of single family homes um, in Livingston. So you could consider something like you know, promote uh, the creation of a variety of household, uh, a variety of homes accessible to a variety of household income levels, household sizes, household age groups, and housing types. That was a little messy, but you get the gist. Um, uh, some really important considerations, which would likely be worked in at the application level, or maybe when a PUD 
is going through approval and uh, the commission is considering <coughs> conditions of approval. We need to see documentation ensuring that the units designated as affordable remain so in perpetuity mm -hmm. um, and make sure those hold up to scrutiny by you know, a lawyer. Um, plans to ensure that prospective renters and or owners do not exceed uh, area median and income limits uh, for affordable units. Um, what does that mean? I'm sorry to interrupt you. That means like if they're in, if they go up there. Basically, they have to like income qualify all the time to get into. Oh, and there just... have to be sort of provisions for um, and this is where we get into compliance. But sort of what are the requirements for compliance? Is there an annual check to ensure okay. that people are still meeting income limits? If they exceed those income limits one year, do they just get evicted? Like some of those details need to be worked out. Um, Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, let's see. Yeah, we talked about some of these other things. I think evaluation criteria could be strengthened to better reflect the objectives of the ordinance and spotlight the extent of public benefits provided. Um, it does look like uh, there are criterion related to uh, open space and transportation uh, at the planning board. However, I didn't see a criterion specific to housing, uh, and this could be where decision makers can consider whether the application is creating housing accessible to a variety of household sizes, income levels, etc. Um, so that might be really useful to have a specific criteria. Again, for public processes, alignment or parallels with existing criteria for like variances or conditional use permits would provide consistency across the processes and clarify things just for city staff, decision makers, applicants, and the public. That can be really useful to just be like, you've seen this criteria before, you know how it works, like that's how we're discussing it. Um, and then there's some other comments in the letter, but I'm out of time, so I'm just... Oh, I also have some comments from Leslie Feigl. <laughs> am, am I allowed to? Yeah, we'll reset the time and we'll count it as Leslie. <laughs> Share those. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Catherine. Of course. Um, okay, so I'm now commenting as Le Leslie Feigl, 303 East Park Street. Um, the note says, look at Senate Bill 3822, which has been approved. I don't have a lot of context there. Um, uh, Leslie is recommending that lot size should be um, a half, minimum lot size for a PUD should be a half acre. Um, with my HRDC hat on, I will say that a LIHTC developer is probably not going to do a LIHTC development on a half acre property. Um, uh, and then a map is missing. I feel like I'm doing her wrong here, but a map appears to be missing. <laughs> and then something is not authorized. <laughs> Sorry. That, okay, I she'll... can provide these. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and put these into the record. <laughs> Thank oh. you. And, um, one Speak more final point thought point. that I is think is- Leslie or is Catherine? <laughs> oh, sorry. One more thought going back to my Catherine Daly 520 okay. South 9th Street, mm -hmm. which is just, it was unclear to me from the regulation uh, whether site plans would be required for all types of applications and not just those uh, incorporating light industrial. And I would strongly recommend the inclusion of site plans, particularly if they call out all of the public benefits that the project is creating. Um, that will really aid in communication with the public and also just make it really clear what's happening. Okay, uh, that is all I have. Does the commission have any questions? Thank you, Catherine. Thank okay. you. And you know, can we just make sure that the letter is included in the packet yes. too? So everybody, okay, great, because the public will be interested. Thank, Thank you, Catherine, you. for the letter and the comments. <clears throat> and thanks to the commission for your graciousness and letting me give her more time. Oh, yeah. Thank you for the expertise. Hi, Patricia. Hi, Patricia Grabo, 204 East Calendar Street. <clears throat> I want to say that I am, I have, a puzzle has been solved in my own mind because I've been advocating for a PUD for Livingston, Montana for 18 years. And it had it didn't come into being. And then I would come back and I would say, why wouldn't we consider a PUD for, for our subdivision? Well, I finally figured out why. It didn't happen for 18 years after bugging the commission over all this period of time. And I've been involved in PUDs for longer than I care to say. 
<clears throat> might date me, which everything seems too lately. Um, this, it didn't happen till now, I think, because we didn't have the planner we have, we didn't have the city manager we have, we didn't have the commission we have. We would not have brought into effect things like time travel, how long it would take to travel from point A to point B. We would not have had an active transportation plan in place. We wouldn't have all of these elements right now. And most of all, we wouldn't have our growth policy. So I am saying, I thought 18 years ago, we should have used a PUD and we certainly would have had a lot more affordable housing over the long period of time. But I, I just want to make the comment that it is, it is like the coming together of great minds at the right time. And that is to me what's happening tonight. And I'm in awe of it. I just want to let you know that. Thank you. Thanks, Patricia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but jazzy. Yeah. Uh, seeing no one else in the room, I'm going to look online. Are there folks online that want to give public comment on thirty on ordinance thirty forty three? Can just come off mute too. I'm not seeing anybody. Are you seeing? Okay. So public comment for ordinance 3043 is closed and now we'll move back to the commission. Um, I think it would be nice if maybe we started with like the clarification around based on public comment, is that okay? I wonder if what Leslie meant was SB 382 because I don't know that there was a three 822, although it certainly felt like there were nearly 4,000 bills <laughs> from the Senate this session. Um, and that is uh, the Land Use and Platting Act, which mm -hmm. I am not sure would incorporate mm -hmm. PUDs, but it's a different process or different. Um, it's just different. I don't know what to say. If I'm mm -hmm. mistaken, please correct me, but I'm not sure that it would apply in this case. Is that correct? Um, I am happy to review and bring back any notes on uh, SB 382 that may be applicable to a future. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure that it doesn't apply to towns our size, no. mm -hmm. unless we opt in, which would be an entire process to opt in, which the commission has not said we want to move in that direction, given, yeah. I would assume, the incredible workload we have before us mm -hmm. with our current goals. Mm -hmm. I know. Um, no. Okay. Uh, anything else that folks want to, I don't think um, Ms. Daly came with any questions for us. I think she came with information. So any other clarifying questions that you would want before we begin? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I think I think that maybe Wesley and I were on the same page about there's a map question, mm -hmm. um, which has been kind of my, like something that keeps coming to my, to my mind, um, which is where would the PUD ordinance apply? Mm. Um, that's my interpretation of map question mark, um, just because I've wondered that myself. Um, I've been, it's been clarified to me that it would apply throughout the entire city on residential zoning districts. One, two, one, three, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so there, it's not, and Jen, please, please clarify if I'm getting this wrong. Um, but it's not like an overlay zone that applies kind of to a specific geography, but rather across the entire city to applicable zones. Is that correct? And parcel sizes, like if you must yes. have. Thank you. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's the way I heard it. May she? Oh, of course. <laughs> um, yes, it's, it's, I mean, it's those zones. And we, we, we can certainly make a map, but I think listing the zones that a PUD is allowed in is maybe more effective because there are zoning map changes. Mm -hmm. And if it, it, sometimes it's hard to keep track of that. Luckily, we haven't had any since I've been here. I understand sometimes they come out at once, but if we do that, then we have to update the map each time for the PUD ordinance. Mm -hmm. So. For me, listing the zones, you're correct. It's those zones that we're listing. And right now we're recommending those 
particular residential districts that if you wanted to modify that, <clears throat> that would be listed. But anything within the incorporated limits of the city of Livingston, that is one of those districts is eligible for PUD designation. Mm -hmm. Does that, yeah, yeah it makes sense. Yeah. Yep. Do you have another clarifying thing? No, I just thought, I just, that was my interpretation of the map comment. So, okay, I'm but, sure you're right. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. All right, so now we're going to move into um, the weedy part where we talk about our thoughts. Um, I don't necessarily think we have to go through our no. process. <laughs> no. I think maybe yeah. we can just take turns and. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. So I think it might be helpful for, for our discussion to kind of like frame the, the purpose of what we're sharing with staff. Um, because we're kind of deviating from the traditional process, we're not like necessarily deliberate, deliberating ahead of a vote. Um, in my interpretation of what's going on, we're discussing kind of our take on what we've seen to give staff direction to bring us back a more complete ordinance that we might feel more ready to vote on. Mm -hmm. um, is that a, a, a valid um, yeah. synthesis? Of and I think on? there might be some serious overlap between commissioners. So maybe we can, if one commissioner brings up a topic that more than one commissioner is interested in hashing out, we can refine what it is we're looking for. And then that commissioner continues to have the floor until they work through their list, Great. knowing that like we're going to be checking things off of each other's list. Does Great. that sound reasonable? That's a really good idea. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I like it. So who would like to begin this journey? Everybody's looking at me. I'm happy to. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have, we can all look good. No. Well, I'm just kind of, yeah. No. I'm checking that we smile. I mean, absolutely. <laughs> Okay, I'll start by saying obviously it's not my area of expertise. I rely on staff a lot too, as well. And uh, and a lot of HRDC is very, very helpful too. Mm -hmm. And suggestions in there, um, I'd like to see incorporated as well, you know, to help define exactly what we're looking for in a PUD. Are there any specifically that you want to name? No, um, I'm, I'm comfortable with. Um, what I've heard from you and, and Tori of what specifically, you know, getting into the weeds of this, you know, where we're at. Um, well, hang on. But I'm, I'm going to continue <laughs> to listen as, you know, I, but I, I'm just, you know, okay. You're on board professing board. my ignorance, you know, <laughs> to this. I know about planned unit developments I have for years, but um, I worked on one <laughs> and uh, my 30 years out here and that's it. So. But to be fair, you know our community, and that's like your yeah, expertise. So exactly. like that's where. You know. But I'm, I'm more concerned getting the language right and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And, right. You know, in what we're doing is legal <laughs> and cool. stuff like that. So, okay, thanks. Go thanks ahead, for taking it off. Up, uh, thanks. Um, so I'm going to start with kind of like higher level comments, and then kind of get into some specifics. Um, I think that there's really like two most important elements of the of the ordinance, and those are the objectives. Um, I think actually it looks to me like in one part of our packet there are six, and another part in the ordinance there's seven. Um, that's fine. Multiple iterations. I I understand that, um, but but those objectives are really are are very critical. Then the other component that I think is is of highest interest and concern is the developer and the pu public benefits. So those are those are the, the elements of this that I think need the most attention and need to be nailed like perfectly are those objectives and then the developer and the public benefits. Um, I want to just acknowledge that I appreciate kind of the connection of, um, of densities and bulk um, Allow, uh, uh, allowances being tied to existing zoning. I think if we were to do it in a different way, it in some ways kind of nullifies the, the zoning ordinance that we have in the city that has been, you know, decades long of public involvement to get to that point. Um, and, I, and I think that 
if we were to, and that there was discussion of div divorcing this from, from um, the, the, the zoning ordinance. And I think that it was the right decision to tie it to the, to, to the existing zoning ordinance. So I applaud um, that kind of structure being used. Um, I want to, and this is actually kind of like a, a bit of a, a clarifying question, I guess, um, but I'm gonna do my best to articulate um, the something that we briefly discussed, which was rezoning as part of the process. Um, the way that I understood it, uh, Jen provided an example of if there were if there was a parcel that was not zoned in a residential way, um, and the developer saw a benefit of of that parcel being so zoned residential so that they could take advantage of the PUD process. Um, that makes sense to me. Um, I think there was a brief discussion however, <clears throat> of tying a rezoning process to the PUD process. Um, and that does not make sense to me. I don't think that that would be a good thing um, because that kind of weakens the the effect of or the the power of the, that that base zoning, which I think is the strength of the way that this PUD ordinance is proposed. So, my my take is that rezoning, if if a developer were interested in rezoning to take advantage of the PUD process, that should and and I think that's how it's described in this ordinance. That should be a separate process. There is an existing process for rezoning a, a parcel. Uh, um, that that's a, mm -hmm. that's within uh, our existing ordinance, and I think that that should kind of remain that should remain the way that it is. Um, if a developer were interested in going that route, it would be very challenging. I mean, it would be very time consuming, mm -hmm. um, and it's a and it's a big change, and that's why such a thing is time consuming. It it requires a lot of um, public input and process. So I think that the way that it's proposed makes sense currently. Um, I think we kind of all agree that through, I mean, through the questions that, um, that we've heard from the public and in the commission, I think we all agree that there's some work to be done to kind of hash this out, to get it to, to a place that we're comfortable voting. Um, and I guess, um, it, does it make sense for me to reiterate like the specific points that I've already that I've already made in in the yes because I think we need to make sure that a majority of commissioners agree with you okay or if there's some like nuance that we need to like uh clarify yeah. that yeah. we can do that and that we stick but yes if you don't mind, you no know. I don't mind at all I just don't want to be long-winded and so far let's start with late. what you've already said keep them separate processes keep them separate processes <laughs> I'll say I agree with that okay I do too no um, so yeah, I'll, I'll reiterate, I'll reiterate just like specific points then, mm -hmm. even for, including ones that I made. I think that the objectives part should be nailed down. I didn't have any objectives that, um, that didn't seem right to me, but there was, I think some recommendations in the HRDC letter of, um, additional objectives that I thought sounded reasonable. Um, so I guess a point that I would be making a specific point is revisiting and making sure those objectives are comprehensive, mm -hmm. like they cover all of the, of the intended objectives. Um, should we just briefly touch on that before you move to your next one? Sure. I can go next and say, I agree. I'm going to frame it as goals, like with our mm -hmm. goals and roles concept, mm -hmm. like that I think we need to make sure we're all on the same page with goals. I particularly like the suggestion about, and I'm not going to get the wording precise, but the objective about diversifying new housing yeah. stock. Um, I felt like that was missing from here specifically. I'm not going to belabor the point because I think it's something that we spent a good couple of years on with the growth policy. Yeah. So I agree with adding that one as well. And then just making sure those are consistent from page 31 to um, 27. Uh, thanks, Chair Nutes. Um, 
should we does anyone else have any other thoughts on a, on additional objectives and i would use the language that was provided yeah like qualifying what diversity and housing mm -hmm. stuff is. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah uh, agreed. Yeah. If I may jump in, commissioners, I would also um, note related to the objectives earlier in the conversation, um, there was comment about the bold type on line B that says to achieve the stated intent, a PD shall further the following objectives. Mm -hmm. Just we may revise that to shall support the following objectives or some mm -hmm. um, something a little less prescriptive, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Gager, for bringing that up because that specific sentence, um, I think, deserves further consideration from uh, from Jen and and also I think from uh, our city attorney. Mm -hmm. I think like that's that's really critical, mm -hmm. um, and I, I I think that that needs to be kind of worked and, and gotten perfectly. So that's a specific point that. Um, and, and then if I may, an additional one and current objective number three, the smaller network of utilities and streets will also yes. oh, yeah. submit that thing. Mm -hmm. More well. efficient, I believe, yeah. was the was comfortable really, language. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Great. Thank you for touching this. And um, I apologize um, for jumping in like this. No, that's no, 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 been super helpful. Just um, pretend this is a work session. It, we're, getting, we're, getting, we're getting, we're getting, we're trying to make magic. Yeah. yeah. And a meeting. We're getting into the weeds. I'll keep going there. Uh, we have, we've had a, a lot of discussion now about the reference to AMI. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that needs to be re reworded as well um, to get that, to get that right. Thank so, you, Commissioner. I have to go take care of my dog. Sorry. <laughs> Tell George hi, friends. Um, so just a, another note to making sure affordable is defined properly. Um, I, I think for me, the thresholds make sense of 100% and 60%. I don't have any, I, I don't have an opinion on the thresholds, mm -hmm. but I think that the way that it's worded just in reference to AMI is not quite what it's going on. A little after. clearer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I believe there was talk of conversing with HRDC to work that out. Um, there, I think that's amazing. I'm super grateful HRDC is so accessible to us in Livingston. They're awesome Huge. and supportive, and I'm so glad they're able to come and give mm -hmm. input. And also, I want to acknowledge that there's other nonprofit housing groups that work in the area. And I think if we're gonna, just like we wouldn't work with only one developer, get feedback from only one developer, we would hope to get input from lots of developers, right? I I also would hope that we can have the capacity to, to reach out to other nonprofits also that work on housing in the area. I'm thinking specifically of NeighborWorks at the very least. Mm -hmm. right. um, and then, you know, the National Affordable Housing Network is located in Butte and they do a lot of work in Southwest Montana. And so it's just another sort of different perspective. Um, affordable housing nonprofit, when we start to do outreach and get feedback, I would like to see it just get a diversity of inputs from it with a better policy, I think. That's what I would add to that bit. That's true. Nice. I, I agree. I think we have this like example that's in front of us of, of mm -hmm. a thought out response to the ordinance, and that's wonderful and um and it doesn't give them sole authority to mm -hmm. to provide input uh that we're gonna be soliciting so thanks for, mm -hmm. um, for that point um so kind of along those lines of soliciting input i asked um Planning Director Severson about the thresholds for public benefit. There are like specific numbers throughout uh, the document. If we're going to solicit feedback on elements, that's one that I think could benefit from uh, additional input. Can you be um, specific which one you're thinking of? Well, no, they're, they're kind of throughout. Uh, an example was 10% of deed restricted affordable workforce housing, minimum two units. but. There, there are just specific like numeric mm -hmm. thresholds kind of throughout the ordinance. And I think that those would 
those where, where there's basically kind of a threshold decision being made, I think that that is a is a good point of conversation to bring to uh, and I would say an audience of experts or something. Like that. Um, and that's not to diminish the expertise of staff. I respect and appreciate the expertise of staff. And I think that those are kind of important functional components of the ordinance that mm -hmm. would benefit from um, potentially additional input. Can I offer? Please. So I um, I agree with that. I'm specifically thinking of, um, I mean, I did some, I made some phone calls to myself around the 10% deed restricted affordable. So I feel, I mean, I still would encourage, you know, staff to do that work, but like I, um, I feel pretty good about that one, knowing that it's imperfect and we're, we never know what's going to happen until we have the ordinance and things move forward. But um, one that I'm more concerned about is the waived impact fees on a one-to-one -one basis for the 60% AMI. Um, the feedback I got on that one was um, that perhaps some more information like the impact fees, these numbers maybe that staff worked out, these example cases that staff worked out, taking that kind of information to um, to these low income or affordable um, housing nonprofits that really are in the weeds in different places in Montana, helping create this housing or working with developers that are creating this housing could help us get more um, information on what's working or what the challenges are. The, the feedback that I got was very interesting about, for example, what's happening in Kalispell, like the city perspective versus the affordable housing perspective. It, it's creating it's creating a housing environment that I'm not sure that might be great for Kalispell, but I'm not sure that's necessarily what we want here. So I think that it's complicated and giving more information to some of these groups will really help make, maybe shed some light on um, us forcing to get serious about what are our goals when it comes to affordable housing and how do we get closer through incentives. I'm not sure that this is it. I'm not sure that this is not it. You know what I mean? It could go either way. I think we just need more info and impact these specifically I'm interested in. With that one, that was a lot of words. I'm gonna stop. Thanks, Chair Nates. Uh, just checking in, um, with City Manager Gager, that you got that um, specific point of, okay. of impact fees and one to one mm -hmm. uh, and those thresholds. And 60% might be only including it on a one to one basis for 60% AMI, might not be meeting that goal of diversified housing stock. And it might also, um, what Vice Chair Kale brought up earlier, like, is this even possible, is a relevant question that people in the business would know. Great. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and then I guess, uh, I'm really actually left with only one more point. Um, to, to Quinn's dismay, um, which is, uh, I, I asked for kind of a recounting of the opportunities for public input thus far. And I think when this comes back to kind of document what, what happened to get us between tonight and the next one, will just be kind of, will help put me at least at ease to, to know that like we, we did the requisite um, uh, engagement to, to get there. So just keep track of, of that those engagements and, and give us like a quick synopsis of that when, when you bring it back to us. And that's it for me. Cool. Who wants to go next? Let me go next. Okay. Um, a few things I would like to see added was, would be specifying how we're doing or how we expect the developers to do outreach to the public um, with land use with land use decisions around the state that I have observed um, through my other work. That can be a particularly challenging um, bit if it's not clear, since the public has a right to know and if the developer does something that technically meets the requirement but isn't like functionally 
meeting the requirement, it can just end up as a really problematic situation for the community. So I'd like it to be specified if we're going to do certified mail. I think it should be part of it um, in the ordinance. Um, <coughs> Looks like maybe we need to get some clarity on the five year limit if that can be waived and reduced to three. Mm -hmm. um, I would just want to say, Director Severson, if that's what she believes we need more information on, that I would support that. And I would be interested to hear. Um, I also want to say that I don't think. So one of the comments was that it's the the developer would determine a way for the public to engage and that could be up to the developer what that looks like i do think we need some parameters around that i don't think that the developer should be totally in charge of what acceptable public engagement looks like i do think it'd be nice to have some opportunity but if the developer says acceptable public uh, public engagement is it on a sunday at I, I don't know like there's i can imagine situations where it's problematic were you going to add something to that one well i i guess oh sorry i went too fast and i didn't let people comment on my individual ones either with respect to public engagement <laughs> the the schematic that uh jen shared with us like showed us the the process and then there were there was the planning board meeting and the zoning commission meetings Is, prior to it coming to the commission are you, are you about hoping? the work session okay yeah so like um i think it should be somewhat predictable for the public and they should have some parameters to know what to expect so that it's familiar um i've seen some strange offerings happen around the state that legally count but functionally are not great for local communities mm -hmm. and i don't believe that we have the people at the tables right now that would allow that to happen and also i know that this ordinance will probably be here longer than many of the people at the tables right now because that's how ordinances work so i just want to make sure we're setting up for the maximum public benefit i went really fast did people have anything they wanted to add about certified mail or the suggestion that jen made with the five year three year okay should i keep going um Uh, one thing that really concerns me about the way this is written, and I'm not sure what the solution is here, is when we were on the planning board together before your commissioner, Commissioner Lyons, um, and I know you were attending most of those, Vice Chair Kale, before you were commissioner, we spent a lot of time talking about the future land use, and um, we spent a lot of time considering the R1 areas near the river where moose and bear move through town and i believe we even have like a moose in that neighborhood mm -hmm. recently um and then we spent a considerable amount of time talking about how we wanted to maintain what we what we wanted to increase density across a lot of the south side of the tracks so we wanted to maintain our two density along that riparian area or the like migration route where we get a lot of bear moving through town and other wildlife moving through town specifically because we wanted to minimize human wildlife conflict and we wanted to not um, make changes that would negatively impact the wildlife that's coexisting with the people of Livingston. Particularly, we we're talking about large game, but there's many other things too, besides moose and bear, right? So one concern I have is the way this is written right now, someone, could put a PUD in those critical areas. Some of those lots are large enough to qualify, and it would really be working against the intention of that part of the growth policy. Yeah. So the, um, it's going to be kind of like deliberation, but I'd love to chime in because I had the, the not specifically as it related to wildlife, but I was thinking about the same thing. Like basically, my my concern was. Does this just kind of nullify the work that's gone into that future land use map and the zoning regulations that that are here? And with with respect to density, which is like really going to be the part that impacts really everything the most, it this this allows for twenty five percent a twenty five percent up to twenty five percent increase in existing allowable zoning. 
So you take R1 and you increase it by 25%. Um, it's not like you take an R1 and then you put in an R3 level PUD in that area. You increase the allowable zoning in R1 by 25%, which is in R1, that 25% increase in allowable zoning, uh, allowable density is not much. There's still not a lot of activity happening there. How about the when you require commercial? Uh, that's a really good point. Um, and that would, the, the, the difference there is it would require, it would possibly affect, it would increase like the, the amount of trip generation. Right. Um, so that, that, that's a super valid point. Um, and maybe, maybe there's a, maybe we can distinguish between R2 and R1 with that requisite for, um, for commercial. Really good point. And I just kind of want to make one kind of general um, response to that, which is when you think about the existing <coughs> footprint of Livingston, there are a number of kind of critical ecosystems mm -hmm. throughout that mm -hmm. existing footprint of Livingston. Um, but I tend to think about planning, I guess, beyond my personal authority in, in at, a, at a regional scale. And when we, when we make a decision not to allow density within Livingston, there's a latent demand for that development in our region. And, and so there are trade-offs in potential impacts to, to the environment within Livingston and then potential impacts happening out in the county. Um, and I, I would argue that with that constraint, <laughs> that it can only be 25% more than the existing zoning. It is a reasonable trade-off to focus that moderate <laughs> density within the existing footprint of Livingston, as opposed to kind of pushing it, pushing that latent demand out into the county where there are no zoning regulations whatsoever. And if I could piggyback on that, how much, how many R1 um, units are we looking in that, that are R1 in that area? It, I'm only looking, I'm thinking of Lock Laven. Yeah, that's and that's it, about the only it's place. It's not like a lot, but they're large lots and they're large lots. And it's right where there's like high right. interaction right. between wildlife and but I kind people. Of, but it's such a small, it's a small number. And I, I, and I'm not sure what it is, but I kind of agree with Tori. Yeah, there's there are some trade-offs. And like you said, it, it is our one, only 25%. We're not looking at a whole lot. No. Well, if, but, if I may, yeah. Um, I would say so there is this this is the PUD will not adversely impact the natural environment, critical wildlife and habitat, agriculture, public health, safety. And local services. Now, I would say that that could be <coughs> subjective to, well, right? Yeah, like that could be subjective by mm -hmm. who's on the planning board, who's sitting on the commission. All right. But there is a good. little bit of regulation there. Um, it's not everything <coughs> for sure, but. Well, you know, I think if it was set up at the work sessions, I don't know what we're requiring at these work sessions, I don't know if we went that deep, but if the work sessions with the developer and the public was requiring these conversations, I trust the people mm -hmm. of Livingston would certainly show up and say, hey, this is what's actually happening in our neighborhood because they know because they live there. And mm -hmm. so, you know, especially if they're notified, um, do, I guess I'll ask that question, do we have anything laid out of what we're gonna require to make sure the developer brings up for the public in those work sessions? So um, we are we are developing um, not only the application and the application requirements, but also guidelines for the, the public um, outreach process. So those will be provided to prospective applicants. And, and I guess one, um, you know, area that I, that I might um, offer uh, to, to the commission would be in section uh, 
uh, E related to application procedures, um, E3I, um, you know, requests and requires other information um, that city staff and, and various boards uh, may request um, to fully evaluate the development proposal. And so I would offer that in, in areas where there is a, a wildlife concern, that would be something that would be um, you know, requestable of the applicant by the city. I appreciate that. And I want to make sure that we're fully considering the public and not an agency only. I mean, I think agency, agencies, in my experience, have really like valuable and critical information to offer that the rest of us don't. And also I'm aware that the agencies, because I talk to them, don't always get the information from people in Livingston, right? So like the people in Livingston don't necessarily always reach out to the agency when there's a wildlife con conflict, so they don't always know what's happening. So I just want to make sure it's robust. So we're not um, leaving the people Livingston out if they're the ones that say, hey, I have like a real lived experience in this neighborhood. This is what happens every year. It just doesn't get reported to the agency. Um, if I may, uh, these catch-all clauses like in subsection I, sometimes can get you into a lot of trouble. <laughs> and so I prefer from a legal standpoint that you have, you define certain things that the developer has to provide you information on. So like, Chairman News is if there's a concern with wildlife, there should be a provision in here. I I just I don't like catch all clauses. They mm -hmm. they can get you into a lot of trouble. <coughs> and I granted I understand the purpose of it, but I think it's broad and so well defined. I just want to yeah. keep us on track. So do you feel like you have what you need mm -hmm. from us? Because you can do some of that stuff outside of a meeting and then bring it back. Okay. Okay. So and wildlife is just one example that I don't remember from those meetings. There's others. Um, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I, I'm taking a, a less complicated. Uh, uh, Can I finish uh, my uh, list then? And then we'll I just want to make a statement right now. Okay. okay. I asked her in a break here, what other cities in Montana have this program? Can other ones do? Yeah. Just number one. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, And I'm, I'm trying to think that, and I, I think the city manager was agreeable. We got somebody back there that's done some research on this all throughout the state. I'm, I'm trying to think and keep it less complicated. What is what is wrong with 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 what you're seeing here? I'm not saying that. What, what what's missing? It seems to me there's something missing in your thoughts here. When it weighs out what's going to be happening, we've got somebody that already is familiar with the program and has talked with other cities. What, what am I missing? They're wildly different between cities is one thing. Every city has that. They're different for each city is one thing. And the second thing is, with all due respect, not all the folks on this side of the room were there for the growth policy conversation, and it's built off of that. So... Commissioner Lyons and I are offering some context based off of the growth policy, which we were a part of creating. So it's just offering some history. Mm -hmm. Can I finish my list and then we can move on to another commissioner? Um, I think that's it. I wanna, I do wanna say there's a lot in here that I really like. Um, I appreciate all the work that went into it and all the iterations that it's gone through. And there's a lot of things that I think are really fantastic in here. Um, and the thought that's gone into it and the laying out of the process for, like the, the, the schematic was really helpful in Jen's presentation, but also laying out particularly the zoning and planning board differences feel really weedy and that's different than other cities. So I wanna thank staff for putting that together. That was really helpful for me. Um, you know, one thing that I think could be really helpful since this process is so different is, um, so we talked about goals of it. I am feeling like I want a little bit more information on roles. So we have the role of the planning board and the role of the zoning commission, but I would also love like maybe spelled out a little bit more clearly or in a way that's easier to digest, like the roles that staff play 
in this process and then the role that the city commission plays in this process um because i've heard some things come up that i didn't see written in here like um a schedule i think was mentioned like we have to vote on a schedule and i didn't see it. so just like some clarity so that um everybody knows what to expect when we get our first one because this is going to be big and different. I think that's what I have for this. Is there anything you would add? I just have a couple things. Um, one, I think we missed because HRDC asked it. Um, our site plans need for all the projects. That's a. I did. Okay. Yeah, that they are. Yeah. Yes. Okay. They're not needed for every single. They're not needed for every. But it is mentioned in here. Okay. That so that was a, a point that HRDC made was that they recommend that they that they do be required mm -hmm. for every yeah. PUD. Yeah. So that maybe we should give direction on what we think about about that. because um, that's a substantive some from what I'm hearing from Jen, that would be a substantive change. change yeah. So the site, can you reiterate what the proposal is versus HRDC's suggestion? I'll, I'll probably need some help from Jen, but uh, there are there are specific types of PUDs mm -hmm. that would require a site plan and some types of PUDs that would not. Um, and HR, HRDC's recommendation is that all PUD applications okay. re would require a, a site plan. <laughs> Just to clarify before you provide the direction. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And and maybe I need to better clarify this. So the city has um, standards or thresholds that require site plan review for developments mm -hmm. for and, and and it's it's not just on which uses, it's the size. So if you're going to um, trigger the need for 20 or more parking spaces, 10 or more residential units. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, I, I want to say it's a commercial retail space that's over mm -hmm. like 10,000 square feet. Um, there's a couple others. Uh, part of this, especially for the residential development part of it. We forgot to make a motion to extend. I'm so pardon, sorry. No, no, no. Can you stay there? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can someone make a motion? I'll make a motion to extend the meeting. Second. So we have a motion. I'm sorry, Jen, to interrupt you. No, that's fine. So we have a motion by. Shorts and a second by Lions. Motion by Shorts and second by Lions. All in favor say aye. 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 Yeah. Okay, yeah. so five yeah. will extend. Thank you. I'm so sorry to interrupt. No, Jen. that's no problem at all. Um, just so for the site plan review in a couple of places. So if you look under on the first page, I don't know what page it is in your packet because I just have the ordinance. So it's uh, C, um, PUD minimum size and allowed uses under commercial uses. So every PUD has to have a commercial component. Um, mm -hmm. We put it in here, and again, we can, according to your direction, I just want to make sure you understand what's already in here. Yeah. Commercial development within the PUD may require site plan review prior to the issuance of a building permit for structures related to the commercial use. Oh. That is put in there so that it may not necessarily be something that would trigger P, uh, site plan review normally. Mm -hmm but you have the ability to require it as part of the overall approval as a condition. Um, for industrial uses, again, it says light industrial development may require site plan review prior to issuance of a building permit for the structures related to that use. Um, I would caution against or just consideration when you're thinking about providing direction, requiring site plan review for anything that requires a building permit, because that would mean every single residential unit would need it. I just came from somewhere that required that. We had 20 planners on staff and we still couldn't keep up. So I just want to make that. I think you're probably not meaning for every single house to be that's built or every single residential structure to need that site plan, I'm guessing, correct? So are you saying that you would like something a little more stringent, maybe to require all commercial uses to have that um, automatically, 
all light industrial, if there are light industrial uses to automatically have that site plan review, if they're not triggered by that, is that the direction, I guess? So um, I think discussing <clears throat> the scale of what site plan, um, the geographic scale of what a site plan is, site, a site plan has to do with a single property. Is that right? These can all be one single property if they don't go through subdivision review. If they are not requesting to subdivide. So if that were the case, I would think that we would want a site, a site plan for that case where it's not being subdivided. Um, we could do that. Well, I would offer actually in that case that it would be subject to site plan review under the site plan review requirement because presumably we'd be adding more than 10 parking spaces in something of that size. That right, because it's got to be an eight threshold. Yeah, yeah. 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 Straight space. So that's in there. So if we want to just refer to the site plan, I guess this was sort of a way to add an additional, if we wanted to require it beyond that minimal, um, the triggers that are already there, this is a way to do it. Yeah. And I, that, I actually think I, I, I don't even know that you need this language to require it. It could just be a condition of approval. Hmm. If that confuses things. <laughs> So where is, can you remind us where the site, other than that bit that you just mentioned, where the site plan review? So C3 are, mentions it and C4 mentions it. And it simply just says they may require it. C, but then um, Mr. Gager also reminded us that um, there are other Triggers of site plan review. Right. More than 10 parking spaces. Yeah. Yeah. Where's that list? Is what I'm wondering. Oh, uh, that's in our um, chapter two of our code. Yeah. I don't know if that's code. It's already in the code. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Chair Nix, if I can mm -hmm. please just over maybe uh, direction to staff is to like illustrate for us what would trigger site plan review and what would not yeah. so that we have a good understanding of where this leaves us and if that comports with the desire of the commission or not because i think we could probably spend another hour yeah. trying to kind of understand <laughs> that and maybe that's not the best use of our time right now but direction of like yeah. illustrate that for us so that we know what what that process looks like mm -hmm. I, I don't I, think it's chapter two i, I think yeah, that sounds yes. very yeah. Um, doable commissioner lines and then I would offer probably for the next meeting that we will also bring some specificity um, related to the PUD application um, because there is reference to that and um, you know as we were going through the ordinance development development process um, we started out with a very very lengthy list of submittals that we would like to see with the application and then at a certain point Jen and I said this list is getting very long. Let's move this from the ordinance to the application form. And so there, there are a lot of materials that are expected, including an overall um, map for the, the proposed PUD. Okay. And I think, and I think that's really what we're. Yeah, what I we're think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. But okay. may I ask why you would take it out of the ordinance and put it just in the application? Um, for a few reasons. Uh, yeah, the, the primary reason, and it's quite honestly, it's the reason that the next ordinance will be before you is that ordinances take um, quite a bit of work to update and having certain things outside of the ordinance allows a little bit of administrative flexibility to um, kind of increase the requirements or, or the number of submittals or diversity of submittals that we may see. Um, so it just provides us a little bit more time and flexibility if you will. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. I also want to make sure that all of the policy priorities are making it in the ordinance because those should be more laborious to change. Mm -hmm. um, particularly some of these things around process that are going to be important for the public. So I think we're going to have to find the right balance Certainly. about what to put in the. Yeah, thank you. That'll be helpful, I think. I think that was maybe it. I think we're, I think we're good and I think we can like I've got it all. I think you all hit most of everything. So, I mean, I had some thoughts about like, but I think 
it will all work itself out as it goes through the review, but just preservation of the grid system and alleys. Um, but I think mm -hmm. that that will work itself out in review in the review process. Um, and there are there are like subdivision regulations to that. Yeah, effect. yeah, and then just connect to connection to nearby trails instead of just not like we're going to put a trail in the PUD, but let's connect to the trails outside of the PUD. Mm -hmm. So hoping that that sort of would work itself out in yeah, the process. That's all for sub I mean, yeah. Agreed. Yeah. So. Um, Do you have any questions for us on things that we met, missed or where you feel like you might be lacking clarity? Is there something you want more input on? Or? You know, I'll, I'll be honest that um, speaking for myself, I think that we have received a good amount of, mm -hmm. of clarity um, from the commission, there's not anything I specifically am missing. It looks like <coughs> Director Severson has the direction she requires. Um, I, you know, I, I guess there was one other point that was brought up um, in the public comment section by um, by Ms. Daly uh, regarding the monitoring of units um, oh. after after oh, yeah. um, the fact, and and I guess. That would be one thing that um, certainly seems relevant and, and maybe worthy of clarification. So, mm -hmm. I'd love to. It looks like I made a lot of head nods on that. Yeah, yeah I would love to. Thank you for remembering that. Um, does anybody feel compelled to go first? Um, so, I, you know, I think my comment on this can be taken with a grain of salt for those who are in the know. Um, but, I didn't have any aversion to any of the, the recommendations mm -hmm. from the HRDC letter. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that's an easier way to put this to staff mm -hmm. is like highlighting or identifying things that we're, we're not interested in, in staff pursuing. But for me, there, I wouldn't, I, there aren't any in here that I would uh, not want staff to pursue. Mm -hmm. I, I honestly feel like I need a little bit more time with this since five minutes is not a long time for me at least to process policy suggestions like I need a little bit more time to sit with this and like reflect. Um, I will say, I think that could be included in the conversations with other nonprofits, I think that Ms. Daly's perspective is interesting and also um, talking to an ED of another um, affordable housing. Um, nonprofit in Montana, uh, she was actually saying that when they have someone in, and, and that was that was the other thing I would add is making sure, do, are we setting up, I'm going to say two things. One thing is when we talk to these other nonprofits, are we setting up um, housing that's just for rental or will it also be um, owner occupied where folks can like build generational wealth by owning these? And so that's one question which the commission needs to figure out what are we trying to do? What's our goal here? And then the second the second topic is the Ms. Daly saying that maybe there's a way to make sure they're still qualifying. And if they're not, right, the, my understanding would be those folks need to move on to other housing and keep this housing available for people who qualify in that, um, that threshold of need. Um, talking to another ED of a different nonprofit, she was saying that if you, if you get people into housing and they are, qualifying because of need and then over time they no longer need they no longer have the need that it's not great to move them out of the housing because it's actually showing that the housing the affordable housing is successful because that that family now is leveling up and it was in fact because of that opportunity to housing so a success story would be you people you put people in because of need and then they can live there as long as they want to live there because that's a success story for some affordable housing nonprofits. So I think maybe like a little bit more input from other nonprofits might be helpful to sort of diversify how we're thinking about success. And it's not to say that um, Ms. Daly's view is wrong. I think there's lots of overlapping right ways to think of the work. So I would say that that one could use more thought and I personally could just use more thought with this, although I'm not, yeah. 
I'm not saying that anything looks terrible in here. I just I just need more time to sit with it. If I could just offer one clarification um, related to that, the, the conversation that just occurred, you know, I, I would say that as as we at a staff level have gone through this um, and the feedback that we've received from um, possible applicants in the development community, mm -hmm. it leads us to believe that um, there will be deed restricted ownership units mm -hmm. that are likely created out of this process. Process oh, and, yeah. and not all just simply be restricted rentals, just to clarify the conversations right. that we've had and what we've heard. Chair Nix, may I jump in? Yeah, please. To that end, I actually think this um, recommendation that says strengthening clarify objective six, and they provide example language. Um, <coughs> No, I don't. I can't find it in here right now. But there was a there was a recommendation around a diversity of housing mm -hmm. types. Yeah. yeah, and I think that that can incorporate what you're talking about of renting so versus too. owning. Yeah. Um, and so that that you know if that gets if that makes it in here, we can kind of clarify what we mean by diversity of housing types, and it could be like housing tenure, like how mm -hmm. what the way that you occupy that housing. Mm -hmm. That's at the bottom of page six. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think mm -hmm. diversity and affordable housing is also critical mm -hmm. for our community. Yeah. We don't want to miss the missing middle, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're talking about some pretty low, 60% is a pretty low, you know, and there's a whole lot. Of, I think there's a whole lot of people at 80 to 100 percent that can't afford to buy anything right now. And there's oh, that's missing too. So I think to hear that. Signal might be above 100 percent to be honest. Yeah, we're probably it's probably more like 120, honestly. Yeah. Like it's probably like 80 to 120. Um, but you know, to think that we can, you know, we need that stock too. So yeah. Thank you for remembering that. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else? Uh, that as I look through my notes, I think that was was the last one. Um, we did, uh, you know, I guess just it, it looks like there will be a deletion on um, oh, yeah. the last sentence of D three A for at least five percent total. Yeah. Yeah. So we we'll have that deletion there, um, and uh, yeah, I, I think that that's. As I look through those in my notes. Um, I would, but of course, we'll review the tape as well. I would just say I support that also. That mm -hmm. staff recommended that, Jen recommended that that makes sense to delete it mm -hmm. and it matches with what Commissioner Lyons was saying. Other commissioners also agree. Yeah. Um, there is one typo on page 30, just the second whereas line, by the way. I'm not sure what mm -hmm. you meant to type that, but, but you can. Yes. I'm guessing that it's the same thing on there. Oh, yes, it looks like there is a superfluous A. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's a, if we're getting into typos, there's a typo on page 32 also. Yes, there's a missing E. Yeah. Where's that? that? I saw that too. <laughs> Gosh. I'm missing E. Where's that? Um, in D, D, I3. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, or DMD Define her as, yeah. Yeah, I saw that. That oh, was yeah. good because that one needed work anyway. So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I want to just really re recap that there's a lot of really good things in mm -hmm. here. I think this commission is just particularly thorough. And it's we're not thorough because this isn't good when it came to us. We're thorough because we're just thorough. So, I really appreciate all the work that's gone into this by staff, by the boards. I think this has been a many months long process before it came to us. And I can only imagine how much better it is today when it came to us than when it started. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for bringing us something that really gets our um, wheels spinning and has us entering the space of meaningful conversation. It's a great example of concerted effort towards and progress towards implementing the growth policy too, mm -hmm. which is, you know, why I'm here. So thank you for, for that, for, for prioritizing it and 
demonstrating that the work's getting done, like okay. it's happening. So thank you very much. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. Okay. Anything yeah. else, Commission, before we move to the next item? Mr. Baker? If I may um, suggest that we uh, make a motion to continue the public hearing <coughs> to a date certain, which potentially could be August 15th. I didn't open a public hearing. Or um, to continue the item. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so a um, motion. Could be August 15th. Is that enough time? It, oh, the, <laughs> the August 15th schedule um, is, is looking like it might be. Uh, a little bit of a busy one. Okay. Well, then let's um, not do it. So if, if you yeah. folks would prefer, we could we could take yeah. it to September. Yeah, yes, I don't even know. Because I think yeah, because I think he said September fifth anyway. Yeah, I mean, yeah, earlier I think you were talking about. Okay, so what? Lay it out for it, us one more time. Uh, a, a, motion. a motion to continue the item till the September fifth meeting. Okay, and if that's going to be the second meeting, it has to be that far apart. It's yeah, not it, the well, second meeting. So yeah, it won't be the second meeting. Yeah, it would be first reading again. For a continuation. Okay. The first hearing. Okay. I can make the motion this time if you folks want. Since Please I do. Yep. Right. So I'll make a motion to continue this item to September 5th meeting. Second. Yes. Motion by Newt, second by Lyons. Roll call, please. Chair Newt. Four. Vice Chair Kale. Four. Commissioner Friedman. Four. Get the shake of the head. Uh, Commissioner Schwartz. Four. Commissioner Lyons. Four. Motion passes. I am just certain we're going to have the best PUD ordinance at the end of this in the state of Montana. Be the model. Yeah. yeah. All right. So next on the agenda is a consideration of ordinance 3044, an ordinance of the city commission of the city of Livingston, Montana, amending chapter 18, section 10A of the Livingston Municipal Code entitled subdivision regulation by eliminating the fee schedule and providing that the fees will be set by separate resolution of the city commission. Mr. Gager. Uh, thank you, Chair Newts. That was a very succinct summary of what the <laughs> proposed ordinance before you folks does. Um, as I mentioned in the last item, um, from time to time, uh, it is appropriate to um, adjust uh, certain um, requirements, um, not by modifying the ordinance, and fees are one of those. And so the city is moving towards a um, citywide fee ordinance that will be presented to the commission in uh, a coming meeting. And before we do so, we are doing a little cleanup of the Livingston Municipal Code and identifying any fees that may exist in code um, so that we can meet those uh, from the Livingston Municipal Code and, and incorporate those into a fee resolution that will be uh, periodically presented to the Commission for update. And so um, this is, is the, the first one before you, and I would stand for any questions you may have. Commissioners, any clarifying questions? I should hold out on this. <laughs> no, it's it's not good to me. I didn't mean it to be like that. No, I mean, Job well done on a descriptive title. You can thank yourself for that. <laughs> um, no clarifying questions. So, is there a motion? I'll move to approve the first reading of Ordinance 3044, an ordinance of the City of Livingston, Montana, amending Chapter 28, Sections X through A of the Livingston Municipal Code entitled Subdivision Regulations and authorize the conduct, the conduct of a final public hearing before its adoption. A second. <laughs> motion by Lyons and a second by Kale. What a very thorough motion. Thank you <laughs> for that language also. Uh, roll call, please. Oh, wait, no, I didn't yeah. say that. Good, I was testing. <laughs> no, this is, this is why it's a team effort. Um, would anybody like to give public comment on ordinance 3044? I'm seeing a no from the crowd. <laughs> and what about online? I'm not seeing anyone come off mute. So public comment on ordinance 3044 is closed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. For helping me. Um, roll call, please. Chair Newt. Four. Vice Chair Kale. Four. Commissioner Friedman. Four. Commissioner Schwartz. Four. Commissioner Lyons. Four. Thank Motion you. passes. Looking forward to that new schedule um, coming our way. I'm sorry, but there was something in the chat that came up. Oh, sure. Oh, there was. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I you. don't see that on my end. 
Oh, one quick question. So, uh, Mr. Gager, how would you recommend I proceed with this since we just did a thing? Well, to be honest with you, the item has been acted upon. And so um, you, you may go back and retake up the item and take up the question if you would like, or you may move on to the next item. What is, is You do have the option to revisit it later. There will be, there will be a public hearing on this. That is correct. Sir. Yeah. So, so you know, want to go uh, Arlene is welcome to provide it in you know to us ahead of time, or provide it in the public hearing as well. It's not the the motions acted upon, but the dis the final decision hasn't been made. So I got it. All information that's coming really to the commission in a meeting like this is open to the public, and I got a chat. We need to figure out how to deal with chats at meetings. So I will read this comment oh, into the record. Okay. I just got a direct one. So it's from Arlene Romer DeFeltre, and I apologize if I just mispronounced your name. But the message says, Melissa, I just wanted to ask about parking requirements, but that can wait. Great, Arlene. I would um, encourage you to reach out via email because you can ask the question via email. I'm guessing you're talking about the previous agenda item with the PUD. And um, you can reach out to I would say the commission, if you want the commission to know, but also um, the city manager, and he can either answer that question, Mr. Gager can answer the question or pass it along to one of his staff. Mm -hmm. um, and she says, yes, thank you. So we'll move on. Does that work for the commission? Okay, next up on the agenda is resolution 5097, authorizing submission of Montana Coal Endowment Program application, Mr. Gager. Uh, thank you, Chair News. The item before you folks this evening, is to approve the submission of an application um, to the Montana Coal Endowment Program um, to um, partially support the, the funding of a preliminary engineering report related to uh, utility improvements in the, what I will term as the Northwest um, part of the town, encompassing the Green Acres, Montague uh, subdivisions, as well as the Sleeping Giant community. And on um, this one, the, uh, the city, does intend to um, partner with NeighborWorks Montana um, and, and uh, they will fund a portion of the project as it relates to the Sleeping Giant community. Um, this resolution is a requirement of the, the grant application that is due um, later in the month of August. So I will stand for any questions that the commission may have. Any clarifying questions? Um, yeah, yeah <coughs> NeighborWorks of Montana um, what specifically is this addressing, I, I guess? You said. So the, the Sleeping Giant community is currently on a private well. And yeah, what, what, what? Mobile home. Oh, it's yes. at mobile home. Yes. Okay, yes. that's yeah. what I wanted to clarify. Mm -hmm. I assumed that's what it was. Okay. The new resident owned mobile home park, for example. Um, it became a resident. Oh, Mr. Oh, okay. Can you yeah, neighbor works has been working with the sleeping giant community and I believe in December of 22, about eight months ago. Okay. Um it the, the community became a uh, resident owned. And okay. so um I'm looking through the process to thank you. I knew it was for sale. I just walked through that. I believe was addressed at one point. Okay, thank you. I yield. Any other clarifying questions? So now we'll do a motion. Okay. That comes first. Yeah. Uh, I'll do it. I move to approve resolution 1597 and, and authorize the chair to sign the resolution. Second. Motion by <laughs> Kayla Singh by Schwartz. And now we do public comment. So folks in the room want to comment on resolution 5097? <laughs> Nobody? Anyone online, if you could come off to you, please, um, if you want to comment on resolution 5097. Anything? Any comments? Any people? Uh, Mr. Willich has offered that he has nothing to comment on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Willich. Um, all right, so public comment is closed for resolution 5097, commission deliberation. It, it, it would be great to awesome. get this done, particularly for that community because I do believe that was one of the mobile home parks that has had to go on oil water. Yeah, with the high, high water times. mark, yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, thank you, Mr. Major. Yeah. 
and also I would just add that the Green Acres community, I remember back in the day when we first started having conversations, they wanted some reassurance that the city was going to work to mm -hmm. offset Absolutely. the cost and we couldn't predict the future, but I appreciate that the city yeah. keeps working to offset the cost to residents. And for the Mon Montague subdivision, Montague subdivision. Montague. I mean, I feel like I've heard it both ways, so I just- Shannon it just sounds better. better. Shannon calls it Montag. <laughs> and the people that live there call it both, which is what I <laughs> when I try to follow. Sounds so, like skin tag. So something. are we ready <laughs> to make sure that's enough, up. folks? Let's <laughs> vote. Roll call, please. Chair Nitz? Four. Vice Chair Kale? Four. Four. Commissioner Four. Friedman? Commissioner Schwartz? Four. Commissioner Lyons? Four. Thank you. Motion passes. <laughs> Save it for your comments at the end. Um, next up on the agenda is city manager comments. Um, thank you, Chair Newts. I uh, apologize to Commissioner Schwartz that we didn't get you out of here by 6.30 as, <laughs> as previously forecast. Uh, legislative progress. Wish well, thank you. Remains a loser's game for all those following along at home. Uh, I will <laughs> offer... Um, Hopefully, legislative prognostications and other losers game on August 3rd. I will be meeting with the county commission uh, related to the wellness center project um, and, and getting um, that moving forward on the ballot. And I um, sent an email around to the commission earlier today um, polling you folks for avail availability on, for a special meeting on August 11th in the morning. Um, to potentially act on, on the wellness center uh, moving to the ballot. So um, if, if you haven't responded to the email already, I would uh, appreciate knowing uh, if, if we have a possibility for a forum on the Can anybody? I think I wanted to, but I don't think I did. But yes, it's fine. I put in my calendar. Okay. So there's one, is there, okay. I cannot be there. I can't commit right now without my work schedule. Uh, Mel, can you commit to a special meeting on the 11th of August at Friday. 9 a.m. 9 a.m. One item. One item. Yeah. yeah. You can do that because we need a quorum. I think you can do it. Okay. I'll get them here. Okay. Okay. So you have three. Uh, thank you. And so my comments. Yeah. You don't need to worry about it because there's three. If you can't make well, it, I won't, be able to check. I won't be able to make it either. So yeah. I'm just saying, yeah. like, we also not give me an excuse. No, I, I will come if I can. <laughs> Thank but I mean, there's no pressure because we have a forum if you can't. Yeah. What else? What else you got for us? Uh, back in yeah, the the okay. August, Friday, August 11th. At 9 a.m. 9 to 11. Eleven. Don't make it take two hours. One. Does that make sense? Here. Yeah. Mentioned at nine to eleven. Scheduled for two hours. Does that look better? You can tell it's an eleven. All right. Okay. I mean, you tell me Quentin's gonna pick him up. Quentin's gonna pick you up. Quentin, I'll call you up. and pick you up the night. I'll call you the night before. I'll pick you up the night before. <laughs> 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 I'll sleep over. All right. Enough. <laughs> Enough. Commissioner Lyons. Um, I'm, I'll just reiterate uh, that I'm really pleased to see um, recommendations from the growth policy being um, moved towards implementation. It's really, I think, important to all of us on the commission. It's important to our community, mm -hmm. and, and it'll feel great to have something to show that we're moving in that direction. So thank you to to all the staff that have been working on that. And it's it's it, it already does demonstrate like a huge amount of research and effort and understanding of uh, the, the will of the community um, and, you know, re, uh, examples from the state. I think it's, it's like really well done. And to Chair Newt's point that she made earlier, to reiterate that point, our, our um, specific weedsy comments on it are just trying to make, make it um, that much better, uh, and it's not an it's not an indictment of what, of where it is today. It's just you, you want to get it right because I I think Chernix is really really hit the nail on the head when she said that this this ordinance is going to outlast um, a lot of the um, <coughs> elected officials, and so we want to just get it perfect. And so that's that's what this attention was, and it wasn't um, 
uh, an, assess, uh, an, an assessment of, of variables. So thanks again. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Schwartz. Uh, ditto what Tori um, said. Um, did somebody really enjoy putting these damn things on here? I like the, the little post and thing because it's a pain to recycle this, get that plastic off. It's the worst part of it's our It's got to be. The worst. <laughs> I, mean, I can't imagine we want to have that keeping the agenda. I don't have the machine to take it off. I mean, you it's know, easy. Faith would it's stick there and go, Yeet. isn't that fun? I go, no. It's easy with the with the light ones when they're big ones. I know. I have to get a razor knife and cut them on. <laughs> Great anyway, comments. if I we go back, there any other comments you'd like no, to that's it, man. I'm done. That's all, all right. the complaints for today, Commissioner Friedman. I yield, okay. <laughs> Vice Chair Kale. Uh, I reiterate everything that Tori said, and thank you, Jen, for all your hard yeah. work. Yeah, very um, very nice. Grant, the fairies are in town, so just remember which fairy hollow is happening. Mayor's uh oh, trail might be fun. <laughs> Um, so just <coughs> that's happening. Yeah. Um, I, I want to say that I will make an assessment that that what we said was not an assessment of the ordinance, <laughs> but I will make an assessment of the ordinance based on what I know from other PDs across the state. I think that what we have in front of us is a very, very good thing and much better than what some other communities have. It might be appropriate for their community, but it certainly wouldn't be appropriate for ours. And so I really do appreciate, I think we're in a good spot and we got, you know, mm -hmm. staff is reading the room well, I think with the public and the conversations the boards for it before it got to this point. So thank you. And it's not lost on me that you two started very close in time together and it's been probably drinking from a fire hose the entire time. And this is probably the first thing that you start doing right after the growth policy rollout. Um, it's been a ton of work. And it was just a few hours at a meeting and it's not reflective of probably the hundreds of hours of work that each one of you individually have put into this. So thank you. It's a major lift and it's not lost on us. Um, the incredible amount of labor that went into this. So thank you. Um, <laughs> If I may, it, it is actually Jen's uh, ninth nine month anniversary on the job. Yay, happy anniversary. Yeah, that's yeah. tomorrow. In your honor. We'll clap for you tomorrow. Yeah. Um, well, we can clap for you now. And also, um, it's awesome. And you two are doing amazing things for our community. So thank you. Um, so now is the time. Where I'm looking for a motion to end the meeting. <laughs> Who will make the motion to adjourn? I will make the motion. <laughs> so motion by yeah. Friedman. I'll motion second eight. that. Second by Kale. All in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> motion passes at 923 p.m. Yeah, yeah, and I say it's 923 p.m. I want the record to reflect that the meeting is adjourned at 923 p.m. Good night, everyone.